I have a problem. What's your problem, John? The staff at my local coffee shop have started laughing at me and making fun of me because I keep ordering the same drink. Well, they get it. I think that's kind of cute. I... Do they just make it when they start seeing you? Uh, you pretty much, and they'll be like, vanilla matcha. And I'm like, yes. And the other day, I was like, I like, needed proper caffeine. I was like, could I get a cappuccino, please? And the fucking two girls behind the counter, like, look at each other. And then a third one goes, yeah, he orders cappuccino sometimes. What? <laughs> I feel like we have now breached the familiarity zone and I need to find somewhere else. No, this is a good level of familiarity. Yeah. No, it's not. This I don't like, like this at all. John, you might get a free I'm coffee. Not I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable. Okay, John, to them, you're a regular and that like if you stopped coming, they would think you died. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So so now you have to commit. Okay, I want to compare this to my earlier coffee experience, with, which is a different cafe with my best friend, that girl. I was thinking the other day that at some point I'm either going to move away or she's going to stop working there and we're never going to see each other ever again and that's perfect. There's something romantic about that. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. For <laughs> no, me, there is. Yeah, it's no. like this like this kind of moment where you have this relationship. Maybe, yeah, maybe romantic is the wrong word, but then it just ends and it's just like, oh, I, I wish them well, but I'll never see coffee guy again or okay okay she really liked what was going on but but now this this other place where i go for coffee like this other place is more of a sit down place i'll go there for a couple of hours like what's like where does it end like are they gonna ask my fucking name is that going to happen i often wonder at what point you do ask someone's name never ben you- <laughs> I, I i know the name of my hairdresser hairdresser is different why because with a hairdresser, you need to ring them up and be like, hey, I need to book Jade for this time. I never booked a hair appointment. Oh, man. I I just walk in. I, I am at the end of a fucking three-year spirit quest for finding a hairdresser. And I finally found one. And she gets it. I haven't, I don't have, I haven't had my hair cut in a while. So don't, this, isn't, this isn't an like, exhibition. <laughs> yeah, ability. no, she really gets it. Um, for me, it's when I get the bus in the morning and I have like, there's... There's the old Indian man on the phone, and if he's not there, I'm worried because he's always there. I I understand that. I used to walk one stretch of Dublin to work, and there was this guy, and it was like my mini fashion show every morning because he was just dressed so good all the time, and I was just like, "Wow, I love seeing you!" Like, but see, that's a perfect relationship. Mm. That is, he is a net positive in your life constantly. Yeah. Now, what would you do if he fucking, like, found out you drew? Yeah, I guess it would take away from that. Wouldn't it? Like, <laughs> Wouldn't it? I, I know. I really like that there's other people out there collecting information on you. I think that's good. Well, it feeds into a larger problem where I feel like I have a set amount of hours around people before they just start making fun of me. We have, like... We have 20 solid hours of kind of like intimidated. Like people are a little like, oh, I think John's a serial killer. And then just an infinity of just playful, painful jabs. John is the punching bag of this podcast. No, he's the little brother. Despite being the oldest. Yeah, despite, despite being, being the, the oldest. oldest. It's, your, it's your, your only child vibe. We need to... <laughs> We, we need to fulfill See, this role. See, now that's public knowledge and everyone, <laughs> next time I'm at a fucking con, people are going to be like, hey, no brothers and sisters. And I'm going to be like, hello. People have brought up weirder shit. Really? Have, oh my God, totally. I, I always give this example, but there was one, <laughs> I think it was a J-Con and it was after my first panel. And there was this there was this guy who came up to me. He was really nice. And he, he um, it was him and his, all his friends. And he he's like, I was like, um, yeah, I'm probably just going to go get lunch now. And he goes, why, it's been more than two hours since you ate. And so then he makes that <laughs> joke. But all his fucking friends laugh because they all listen to this goddamn podcast. John, this bothers you so much. You you like, you like you talk about the guy remembering your food thing. It was so unnerving. Much. It's like, what, what if the fucking people in the cafe found that out? <laughs> <laughs> then they could make fun of you more. See? See what happens when you give away information? It's always a lose. Like, everyone should just be perfect arm's length away. And this universe should exist in perfect silence. Polite silence. All right, bubble boy. Yeah, Jake. (laughs) 
Welcome to the Let's Fight a Boss podcast. The world's strongest video game podcast. I am sitting here with two of the best damn fortune tellers you are ever likely to find. To my left, he reads the stars. It's the Oracle. I am all 12 star signs. It's Brian. Do you ever see that 13th star sign they made up? Yeah, that's me, Brian. It was a giant clubbing a snake. Whoa. We have the windows open because it's fucking roasting. It's hot as balls. It is. And if you hear engines revving or sirens blaring, that's a little treat for you guys. That's a little... A little Take a uh, shot every time you hear a car. No, Neve, don't encourage people to do... It's a little, <laughs> little audio ambiance. Yeah. To my right, she is the future. It's Neve. Hi. With you always, it's me, Jake. <laughs> what, are you so, what are you so amused by, Brian? You have like 10 names now. Yeah, I know. I know because people shout them when I do panels. Yeah, because uh, con season is pretty much starting next week. Um, oh, fucking con season. Oh, and my I God. can't wait to hear the stories you tell us the following you know, few weeks of just all the... You know, just the very special guys you encounter. I've had to come to terms with just the idea recently that I'm never going to have, like, a normal holiday. Like, it's just never going to happen. A normal con holiday? No. Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you did get stuck in the time loop in Spain. What? Did I? What? The duplicating hotel. Oh, <laughs> my God. That was, the that was like, the most insane I've ever felt. Um. So, like, like if you went to Egypt... Would would would, would uh, you somehow fuck up there? I'd be chased by a mummy or something. Okay, that's a that's an okay thing to say, right? Mummies, that's not. I think that's okay. Okay. But when you were saying the fortune teller stuff, I was like, don't say it. What, Brian? Your knowledge of like offensive material is so impressive. Sometimes because I'm such an offensive. I would not like if someone was like, "Hey, hit that fortune teller with a slur." I'd be like, "Hey, future eyes." John. Oh shit, really? Is that it? You never point oh, out the eyes. eyes. <laughs> well, I, well, it's actually a hey, third eye, but you know, you wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. No, no, no. I see we're firmly in the attitude era. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like the worst kind of hazing. I was like going over the intro to the last podcast when Brian, and it just, when Brian just going... Fuck you, John. Fuck you, me. Fuck you, dear listener. And I was like, do I leave this in? No, fuck them. I, no, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> they know. We know. Fuck everything. Oh, they get it. They get it. It's fine. Brian, why don't you tell us about something else that's fine? Namely, the beach bum. <laughs> <laughs> the beach bum. What a fucking film this is. This is Harmony Kareen's new film starring Matthew McConaughey as a beach bum. Who? Harmony Kareen is the director. Matthew McConaughey, he was a true detective. <laughs> Thanks. Harmony Kareen is the director of a little film called Spring Breakers. <laughs> John has just done a spit take. I just, I really love that film, and I only love it more with time. Okay, Spring Breakers came out in 2012, so that was seven years ago. Holy fucking shit! We went to see Spring Breakers seven years ago. Yeah, that's nuts. It feels like it's been longer in everyone's life. Yeah. Okay, so this is after a prolonged time and, like, Harmony Korean didn't know what to do next. He decided to go back to Key West in Florida and film another movie in the exact same location that he filmed Spring Breakers. And it's a film about a, um, a very relaxed hippie writer played by Matthew McConaughey with a crooked tooth. And every ten minutes, the movie changes. So it's just him in a location, and then 10 minutes later, he's in a different location. Uh, but he meets just a very interesting cast of characters. Snoop Dogg is in this film as a rapper and cannabis drug lord called Lingerie. It's really uh, really pushing the boat out with those crazy experimental roles, right? Uh, but please, just call him Ray. Um, and there's a bit where they go to his mansion, and there's just guys with Uzis everywhere. <laughs> Uh, he has a uh, he has a plane. I actually just want to get the name of the plane up because it was very funny. Oh dear, here we go. 
His plane was called Chronic Ev- uh, Chronic Aviation, and it has weed signs all over it. Brian, was this movie good? <laughs> it doesn't seem... Or is it amazing? Like, is it like Spring Breakers, where if you love it, you love it, and if you don't like it, you really don't like it? Same. Okay. Absolutely. How do you uh, feel about Spring Breakers, Neve? I love it conceptually. I don't know if I enjoyed it while watching it. I... We saw it in the cinema. Yeah. And I really feel that that my experience might have been different if I hadn't seen it. But, like, from the fucking, like, first second when Scary Monsters and Nice Sprite starts playing, I was like, yeah. This is a very, like, the, the music in this movie isn't good. But, oh. like, the cast of characters he meets is amazing. So, like, the okay, so he checks into rehab at one point and he meets Zac Efron. And Zac Efron's in the movie for just under 10 minutes, but the impact this character makes... So I, I, I'll, I'll uh, try and break down his character design. Okay. He has, uh, like, a faux hawk, where it's kind of buzzed at the side, but kind of quaffed into a kind of pompadour mohawk, but it's bleached peroxide blonde. Then he has a beard similar to Gyro Zapelli from JoJo Part 7, where it's segmented into parts. Weird. He has a Bluetooth headset on his ear. Um, he's constantly vaping out of one nostril. Right on, man. Um, he's wearing skate clothes from the early 2000s. Right on, man. But the jeans he's wearing are the ones with the giant flares. Oh, nice. Where, like, it's like 10 inches diameter. Hell like, yeah. Or, or, or circumfer- I, I, like When are we fucking- going back to that? I'm sick of this skinny shit. And whenever his Neither car... Me, sick of this skinny shit? No. God, no. I can't even lie about it. Okay. Okay. And then the best thing, because I just thought this was such great sound design. Whenever his character moves, he has sound effects. So, like, they'll run, right? But when he runs or moves his arms, they go... But, like... Weird. But, like, he's not making the noise out of his mouth. Like, they put that in in post. Sure. Uh, Martin Lawrence is also in this movie. He hasn't been in a movie in eight years. Who's Martin Lawrence, yeah. Brian? <laughs> he's the, I missed him. <laughs> he's the other bad boy. Do you not know the film Bad is he, Boys? Is he like the softer bad boy? Will Smith is in Bad Boys. I've and never there seen is, bad and there boys. is a, You haven't seen Bad Boys? It sound, it's, it, you know what? It sounded a little much for me, honestly. Bad Boys is fucking amazing because it's Hollywood's most expensive actor, Hollywood's most expensive director... And Martin Lawrence making a film together. What age were you when you saw it? I was like 12. See? Yeah, I can't yeah. remember. Would you not rewatch a movie that you liked as a child? Not bad boys. Uh, very rarely, actually. I'd like to do it more. A lot of times I like them less. I think I watch like 10 movies a week. You do. You do, Definitely. yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, the Beach Bum is for uh, very special people like me. And if you're curious, check it out. It... I, 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 I had a blast. There was a cute kitten in it, and a bunch of stuff happens, and it's not boring, but it's fucking weird. Okay. Neve, why don't you tell us about Book Smart? I saw Book Smart, which is Olivia Wilde's directorial debut. Do you know Olivia Wilde? What was she in? That name's familiar. She was she Alex in the-, in the OC. Yeah, I know her. Yeah. And she was in, uh, in that In Time movie with Justin Timberlake. She and she was also in Tron Legacy. <laughs> Olivia Wilde is way too good for the role she's gotten. Yeah. I, I feel for her. It must be frustrating. She's always like, beautiful woman one. Uh, because, yes, she is. She's very beautiful. Um. Oh, I, I saw her do an interview for this. Okay. Yeah, this is her de- directorial debut. It is a teen coming of age comedy. Yeah. And it stars... Its premise is there's two... <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> two funny girls. There's two funny girls, Amy and Molly, and they are the nerds of their high school. They have spent all their time studying, getting their grades to perfection to get into college. That is all they've done. They haven't partied, they haven't had fun, and it gets to the last day of the year and they decide, we want to show everyone we're fun. And what follows and what happens is just kind of, it's the classic coming of age film, but somehow more compassionate or just gentler. Like it hits all those kind of beats. Like you have your gross out moments where like someone vomits and someone gets sick or something. 
but like there's a bit where they have to chase the drugs and yeah they keep meeting the same people over and over again and they go to like a bunch of different parties you know that kind of there's an animated segment there's like every beat that you could hit in this genre was hit but it was hit in such a different way um that made it like interesting to watch as a movie but also really enjoyable and fun like it was really heartwarming um centers around these two girls and they're just really trying to prove themselves as being fun for just like for such such humanizing reasons like sometimes the bad guys or the bullies in one of these films are just kind of they're bullies and this was just like we were never mean to you you guys wrote us off from the start so there isn't this kind of combative energy between everyone like it seems yeah. like a really nice school where everyone you know could be themselves to the to their best degree and it was kind of like you didn't give us the chance to be ourselves because you kind of wrote us off as these kind of tropey tropey people and it's kind of up to the smart girls to kind of prove themselves to be fun but also kind of learn about everyone else they kind of went to class in with in this one kind of night so they go party hopping across it and hilarity ensues did you enjoy it brian yeah that was cool um, like it, it, I guess it kind of reminds me of like films like Superbad and stuff. Like it, it's definitely by the numbers with that kind of mm. teenage comedy, last day of high school party movie. I do have kind of a weakness for that stuff. Yeah, like yeah. there's one called there's there's one that came out a long time ago that has Jennifer Love Hewitt in it, where a guy wants to confess to her at at the last part party at high school. Like it, it, it is a popular, I guess, kind of yeah, like set piece, but. I guess it hasn't been done in a while, and I guess like it, it's okay to kind of reuse this template, but it's done in a pretty interesting way. Like it felt original. The dialogue is all kind of improvised as well. Like they, they clearly had a script, but they would just you know do 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 the line line off the script, but then do a couple improv takes and mix it all together. And everyone was so charming that it just worked. Uh, Billy Lord is in it, and she plays Gigi, and she's just that character kind of just can appear anywhere kind of nearly the magical one yeah uh, and she just does a she just does a, such a good job i found her so funny everyone's acting is just on point there's a spontaneous dance number loved it yeah it's done really well it, it reaches like there's there's this moment where you're kind of like oh no don't break their hearts and when the inevitable happens it hits on such an emotional level that i was i was like wow this is some really good filmmaking like it just it kind of hit where it needed to hit in a Mm. way that you wouldn't expect for i guess the genre yeah it's cute but it's not schmaltzy yeah yeah it still keeps its gross out hilarity like there's a drug infused stop motion moment where they're both barbies <laughs> you yeah, know? That oh, that's really, cool that fits good mm-hmm. yeah like like it's, it's got bits that come around your broad city and pen 15 as well where it's like gross female hygiene jokes or gross masturbation jokes but like stuff that like wouldn't have been discussed in comedy 10 years ago but now they're like fuck it let's do it that's cool and i are you like the bit with um the girl's parents and how like civilized they are and mm-hmm. just the bit with the teddy bear oh god they're such a <laughs> it's just such a brilliant masturbation joke yeah <laughs> it's kind of like oh wow <laughs> they're going for it and it's great <laughs> good stuff yeah <laughs> john i think you'd like it yeah it's a it's a good one of these films <laughs> i really hope olivia Wilde stays in this genre yeah i, really I want to see her to make another one of these specifically yeah I think she could make a like she, she's really it's, good at it's this it's really cool she got a chance to direct mm. because like you are totally right she has just played like beautiful woman x for a, a really long time now she was in the house wasn't she yeah she oh was God, yeah. Whoa. weird brian i am so curious about what you made a toy story for i love this okay Yay. i i was so worried about this movie i love the toy story films every single one i love woody so fucking much. He's like my favorite cartoon character. Did you like that thing I sent you the other day? Yeah. I even like that. John sent me a weird video. Was it of Woody? Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Let's just say that there's body paint that looks like Woody. It's a girl on Instagram. 
she does this like uncanny fucking weird ass body paint and she does like lots of Dragon Ball Z characters she's done like Majin Buu and stuff she had a really famous one of Majin Buu <laughs> and she did Woody and it's like against a black background so you can't really see it's a person and so it's just this weird sentient looking Woody like creature it's fucking weird I'm one of the people who owns that Japanese figure of Woody with the creepy face I, I just I really really like Woody um and I thought Toy Story 3 ended super well. I was like, yeah, like, that that's a nice bow on it. Like, leave it at that. And, like, since then they've done a couple of shorts that come on before, like, Muppet movies and stuff that are, like, five minutes long. And they're, and they're really, really fun. I like seeing them. But, like, I kind of figured, like, the big stories were all told. But they managed to tell another story, and it's genuinely good, and it ties up... Like what, it ties what, it up what properly. Is the story? I don't. I don't know anything about this movie. Okay, so you know the way at the end of Toy Story Three, they get uh, Andy gives his box of old toys to uh, to the girl Bonnie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And asks her, "Can you take care of these toys for me?" So it's it, it it's it's like two or three years later, and Bonnie plays with her toys. But like, you know, as a kid, you play with certain toys and don't play with other toys. Yeah. Woody's one of the toys that just doesn't get played with that much. Oh, that's fun. So he's in the cupboard. And I guess, like, Woody's kind of interesting because, like, his biggest fear was to never be played with. And so that's still a fear. But then his even bigger fear is becoming a lost toy. And that's kind of been pushed throughout all the films about them being lost because they're so small in this big world that they don't have any control over. Mm. And it really pushes into that. And the family go on a road trip and the toys go along for it. And Boo recognizes Bo Peep's... Uh, lamp, because she was a porcelain uh, figure, a part of the lamp, and he and he reconnects with her uh, while they're camping, and the and and their RV is settled down for the night. But I guess kind of like watching it as an adult, it feels like you know when you reconnect with a friend you haven't seen in a couple years, and your values and their values are different. And it's not, a, and like, I, I, I know there's extreme examples where, like, someone, like, you might meet them and they might just be, like, they might say something really politically incorrect towards you or, like, Or you know, something too politically correct, in yeah. my case. Or just, 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 just something that, like, you wouldn't agree with. And, like, it, it's not that. It's just, like, the way they think is in how you think. Sure, yeah, yeah. And so it taps into that. And, like, Oh, not, that's, and that's so, cool. And so, like, they're not wrong. Yeah. And, like... There's sort of a villain in this movie, but really it's more the circumstance that all the characters are put in is the villain. There's uh, an antique store, and there's a doll in it called Polly, and she's voiced by Christina Hendricks. Oh, cool. Huh. And she does it, she does the voice with so much cadence and grace, where, like, she's just, like, so polite, but she's not being manipulative, but, like, she's delusional about what she wants as a toy. Oh, that sounds but, so like. Good. She wants Woody's voice box because she has a broken voice box. I love the themes of Toy Story. They're so rich. Like, that's yeah. so interesting yeah. to want someone's voice. Yeah. And, like, it goes to really interesting places. And, like, I didn't even touch on Forky, who is a handmade toy who yeah. becomes self-aware. There's a bit where, like, Woody is walking along with Forky because they get separated from the other toys. And Woody has to explain the events of the last three films. <laughs> so then it just hard cuts. And, like, Forky's like... Wow, Buzz seemed really delusional, and Woody was like, "That's what I was trying to say to them." <laughs> like it, it just and like like there's a bunch of new characters, and they all work super well. There's one who's like a Canadian evil Knievel, uh, voiced by Keanu Reeves, and he has like a little pump up like uh, thing to make the bike go fast. But like he has the tragic flashback because in each movie there's a toy who has like a flashback to like when they were discarded away. Um. Is Keanu Reeves good? Yeah. Okay. Key and Peel play a bunny rabbit and a duck plush who are sewn together. They're fucking brilliant. There is like fake Polly Pocket, but she's called Officer uh, Officer Giggles McDimples, I think. <laughs> and like you they like, like that, you like that didn't you? Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> they like open up her little like diorama and she's up in the bed, but she has to go down the steps. <laughs> And then has to go into a little car and then exit and go, hello. That's amazing. Bo Peep is fucking <laughs> this, awesome. This sounds great, Brian. Yeah, um, I don't know. It just felt like, now, like, this is a Woody story. Like, a lot of the characters mm. are put to the side. Like, you know how in the last movie, Mr. Potato Head was, like, 
full f- forefront when they had lots of material with them. Yeah. Like, Mr. Potato Head is barely in this. Like, Bullseye the Horse isn't in it, really. I'm, I'm fine with that. I really would love, like, more Jesse time. Mm-hmm. Jesse isn't really in it, but there's a bit at the end. So, like, the last five minutes of this movie fucking broke me. Because it's just, it's 25 years of, like, Toy Story. And they do a thing, and you're like, holy shit. And, like, all the characters that you've, like, known, like, like the core characters, all get to do, a, like, a bit, like, get, get to have an exchange with each other. Mm-hmm. But the bit between Woody and Jesse is so fucking good. I, I, it's fucking amazing. And, like, this film was written by, like, eight people. And it was in production hell for, like, four or five years. Um, I love that they pulled it off. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. No, yeah, no, they pulled it off. Because cause, cause I, I, I know a Toy Story 2 is the same thing. They made that film in under a year. Because the film got fucked up and it got deleted off the server. Oh, man. I, I read some, like, behind-the-scenes <clears throat> stuff of Toy Story 2. Yeah. And it just sounded like just awful there was this really horrible story about an animator leaving his kid in a car yeah and the kid died or no, the kid did die. Oh, it Jesus. did not that no, did not happen the kid had heat stroke yeah yeah they had to like pour water on it yeah. and wake it up and stuff yeah holy shit no um <laughs> I, I i just but like it's really it's it's really interesting end of an era with pixar as well because since since this came out they've been like they've been saying that for the foreseeable future they're not doing sequels or prequels or anything like that really they want to do original stories and push more first-time directors. That's and, cool. Yeah. Uh, Pete Docter is the creative director of Pixar now. He's the guy who made Up and Inside Out and Monsters, Inc. And he has a film coming out next year, and it's called Soul. Okay, heavy title. Yeah, and it's about... Uh, it, it just has one sentence. I think it's like the journey of a soul through New York. Wow, okay. But, like, he made Inside Out, and he pulled that off, and, like, the synopsis for that was just, Did like... He- did I he? love that movie. That film's amazing, that, that John. That movie's great. John, get out. It's fine. It's a, it's a, you know what? I agree. It's a great C plus movie. Oh my God. It's No. That is one of Pixar's A films. Yeah, that's Absolutely. one of their best. No. Totally disagree. Um, but yeah, Toy Story 4, I was... I, what I'm if like, we get some goofy characters and they go on a whimsical adventure together? Now, Up, there's a movie. Up's amazing. Um, What's your favorite Pixar one, Eve? I feel bad if you say it's a new. Um, God, okay. Cars mm. 2. Cars 3. Brave? I like Brave a lot. I don't know. What am I looking at? What are the movies? Like, like, a Pixar movie. A Pixar, yeah, but I get mixed up. Pixar am I putting movie. Tangled in there? No, that's a Disney film. Yeah, but it's Disney Pixar. No, it's not. It's Disney that's Studios. Disney. <laughs> okay, fine. But, um, <clears throat> Would Tangled be in the running? No. Oh yeah, for sure. That'll be that run. I, t- Tangle's <laughs> amazing. I love Tangle so much. Um, uh, I hate that I'm doing this. I don't know. Inside Out, maybe. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's a what good about movie. what about you, Bryn? Uh Either Wally or just the amalgamation oh, of Toy Story. Oh, I love Wally. I'm not into that at all. I, I, I was pretty because it's got a boy and a girl. <laughs> yeah. I I don't like my breeding couple, even if they're robots. <laughs> I can't tell who's talking. Neither Brian. <laughs> uh, I'd say I, I think I'd go with either original Toy Story. I love that movie so much. Or up, I think, you know, love up. I really up like a Bug's good. Life as well. Um, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen Bug's Life. Oh, it's brilliant. It's good. Yeah. Fuck that grasshopper. Fuck him. Finding Nemo is it's not great. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of Finding Nemo, mm-hmm. but I appreciate it. It's, uh, yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm, like kind of, I'm kind of the same with Incredibles. Like, you know, Incredibles like does so fucking well, but I'm like, okay. People love Incredibles. Yeah, they and like, fucking love it. People I love like Incredibles, but it's just like people's passion for Incredibles. Is yeah, I like insane. Incredibles. I like Incredibles too. Mm. How about that rat movie? Oh, I love Ratatouille. Oh, okay, yeah. Ratatouille. So <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Ratatouille and um, Inside Out. Is that what it's called? <laughs> I'm having a really We, we have day. inverse Pixar taste, Neve. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, the Good Dinosaur. Have Have you guys seen the Good yes. Dinosaur? That, that, I don't like that. Movie. No, that yeah. that is a that is an underwhelming. It's a film. very long tech demo. John, what's your favorite? Uh, Upper Toy Story. And Brian. Yeah, Up, Wally, all the Toy Stories. Just, just okay. like all all the films except Cars, and to a lesser extent, The Incredibles. All of them, but Cars is cruel, <laughs> but fair. But Cars, they're terrible. They're not good films, and I've seen all three of them. And if a fourth one came out, you would watch it. I need to see everything they make because I need to know the highest of the highs. 
but I need to also know. You need the, the context. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I need to, you know, check my fucking reference. Neon Genesis Evangelion came out on Netflix. I, you guys probably didn't see about that because no one was talking about it or anything. No. It slipped by me. Yep. There's no hot takes or anything, is no, there? No, and certainly not on this podcast. No. And so that brings us into... To a strategy talk. <laughs> so Neon Genesis Evangelion came out on Netflix. Um, Still good. I think it's really cool that Evangelion is so accessible to so many more people now. Yeah, me and too. And I think it's really good that the original Japanese voices are in there. Yeah. Because I fucking hate that dub so much and I can't help it. Do you, do you hate it? I, I, I like the dub. absolutely despise it. And look, straight up, a lot of this is just crazy subjective nostalgia. I'm not making the argument that like the voice actors are fucking terrible or anything like that. I do think they sound kind of flat. I do think it sounds like a very B tier anime dub. I think some of the oh man, that's harsh. I think it's pretty okay. But John, but no, I think it's okay. Good. But I mean, like, if you watch a lot of anime dubs, yeah, this is those guys. Okay. And I think a lot of the like, I'm I'm a big fan of the original dub, and you could say it's just because that's what I grew up with. In which case, I say that's fine. I'm okay with that. But there's a lot of like life and snap to that dub, and it is kind of imperfect and weird and stupid. But I love it so much, and watching the dub of the new one was so uncomfortable. Like I liked Gendo's voice. Yeah, I thought Gendo's voice was all right. Yeah, he was my favorite. Um, I thought Mis- Misato's voice was wasn't bad. Like it was fine. The rest of it, it was just like, "Well, guys, watch out!" Yeah, I just it bums me out when Ray's like an anime girl. I like. I think everyone kind of got it spot on, except for maybe Toji. I felt he was a bit more of a cool guy than kind of a gangstery guy. I thought, I thought, I thought Shinji sucked. Oh really? Yeah. I I think it like I kind of feel Shinji like. I think Shinji might bother you more if you watched more anime because that guy's in everything. Maybe I guess I'm just coming from original Evangelion to this kind of thing, and yeah. kind of that's where I'm comparing it from, and I don't really watch that much anime but like as a comparison between the old one and the new one i think like he that that voice actor can scream like they can really scream and like they scream when they need to and it sounds pretty good like i'm believing it yeah it the screams didn't bother me everything else did so what's evangelion about nothing it's about just nothing it's about 14 year olds in just dude wanted to draw some hot teenagers and robots and that's what he made a show about that's all are they robots no. no. Absolutely not. There's a few things with the dub and it's less like I I don't mind the voice acting. I think everyone pretty much nails their part and it's like unless you've weird nostalgia like I do and you do, like it, it there'll be some inflections that you kind of feel on cue should happen and they don't and you're kind of like yeah. aw. And I fully accept that that is a huge part of my reaction to the dub. Yeah. Cuz like like, I've watched Evangelion dubbed more than I've watched any other anime. But, like, if you're coming into this as a new person watching it or just revisiting it, it's like, yeah, I think, I think if they do I a think good it would job. Do the like, job. Yeah. Totally. And, like, one thing, I think that happens a lot with anime, especially when you get to, like, the sub dub debate. People always want to push, I guess, like, their experience. So, if people grow up with the sub, they want to push that. For me, I grew up watching this on, like, the sci fi channel, you know? So, like, it was all I had and I loved it. And I don't feel any need to push that on to other people i think you know watch watch it in whatever form it's still evangelion some of the localization stuff though that's more the issue i'm having is some of the script choices are kind of weird yeah it's like they don't say the fifth child they say the fifth children yeah Yeah. so keru goes i am the fifth children it sounds so weird i don't understand why that decision was made it it just does not sound good and there's something there was just something so biting about like Asuka being like you know first child and like yeah. you know there's just there was a bite behind those sentences at the time that it's just not it doesn't come across using using it in this way third children it just doesn't work because yeah. every time they say it you're like what? oh it takes me out of the yeah. show yeah, it's now, broken English. maybe mm. some I don't know if like if someone new to it would get i mean i think it still sound awkward but it's still like yeah, yeah. The, like it's, it's just wrong it's stilted for a sec mm-hmm. what got me was um unfamiliar ce- ceiling 
Yeah, I love that line. Me too. It's I so was, relatable. Like it, it slam cuts to Shinji in the hospital bed. Yeah, in in, in the second episode, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and this is after like it cuts with the fight, and you don't know like it went into berserk mode. You don't know what happened. A slam cuts to uh, the hospital bed. And it's Shinji looking at the ceiling and he just utters two words. And I said it out loud when his face came off screen. It was like unfamiliar ceiling. And in this, he doesn't say it. He says something like uh, a different ceiling or like, it's just like, a, it doesn't have the same flow to it. I don't even know what he says because it's so unremarkable, but unfamiliar ceiling, uh, ceiling was, oh God, I can't believe I'm going on about this so much, but it was kind of Evangelion. It's Ava though. And yeah. Like, and like, it was like cellar door, but for Evangelion, it what, was like the nice yeah. words. And like, I, I've... You know, I have seen people online being like, oh, people are getting so worked up about the chain. And it's like, yeah, it's fucking Ava. Yeah, like, if, if it, people are going to get worked up about one show, it's going to be this. Like, the thing I would say about the dub with Ava is it nearly didn't matter how good or bad the voice performances were because I might as well go home and my parents started talking with different voices. And I'd be like, well, your new parents, pretty good voices. And I'm like, yeah, but they're not my parents, you know? That's what it was like to me. And just, I had such a... Uh, just like revulsion of it it was like this weird uncanny thing where i was like nope i can't like i watched the first episode and then i skipped through the other episodes to see what like asuka and kaoru sounded like in the kaoru episode they like pronounce kaoru's name one way in one scene and then a different way in the next scene and that also bothered me they they, they pronounce a bunch of stuff differently like like zele is with a z now it used to be sele mm-hmm. but now and it's zele nerve is more nerf yeah <laughs> And like and, and 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 the magi is the the ma- ma- magi 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 yeah magi yeah they changed I love you too I like you yeah you're worthy of my grace um yeah. there's and, and also it, it, at the start of end of Evangelion they changed I'm so fucked up to I'm the lowest of the low it, but then but then in end of Evangelion there's a lot of swearing just to be edgy I like it. And here's the thing, like, I don't think anything's lost in the sense if you're a new viewer. Maybe there is a bit, but I don't know. I don't feel like... it's Maybe it's with Kaoru and Shinji's relationship, I feel like tell, it... Though, you yeah. Because, like, it, it's like, it's like with the when they redid the Silent Hill dubs, mm. and, like, everyone was like, this is, like, this is a fucking travesty. And then everyone, like, all the new players were like, what? Like, what's wrong? The dub's fine. Yeah, like you, you know how they don't have the fly me to the fly me to the moon at the end. Oh, that stung. Yeah. That stung bad. But like that 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 was part of it. Mm-hmm. I was thinking I could go into this like kind of unemotional when it was coming out. Like I just like look, I'll just take it for what it is. But then Fox messaged me that Fly Me to the Moon wasn't in it, and I just wrote back like <laughs> "fuck, enter that all caps." I get it. I'm in the like privileged position where I'm watching it with someone who kind of wants to see it for the first time. Like, I'd probably be more tolerant if that was me. Yeah, but just like and like 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 my my girlfriend is really enjoying it, and seeing her enjoy it is bringing back all my enjoyment as well. And like, it's it just like even ignoring the dub, ignoring the script, like Eva looks so good. Yes, it 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 looks so gorgeous. Like you've got so much pink and you've got those long scenes where it's just like, it's like, it's a a still and it just works. Every couple of shots they just go fucking insane with the lighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I, I, I love when the sun's about to set at at every battle and it's just, everything is silhouetted against. Oh, there's one, there's one scene later on. I think it's when Shinji goes disappearing or it goes disappearing. Um... And like Listening. the whole scene is nearly like just black with shadow, and you can just make out the rim highlights on characters, and like a whole scene plays out like that, mm. and it's so cool. It's still one of the strongest looking shows for me, and like what I love about it is like it's still there, and I think people will get it from it. I really do, even the, even when they're watching this dub. No, I'd I, I'd never make the arguments that new people won't. Like, well, you know, not everyone's going to like it, yeah, obviously. Yeah, for but sure. I don't think the new dub is going to, like, damage it for newcomers. But definitely is, like, a very old school. Like, I've been watching... Ava has been in my life for more than half my life. Like, I, it's just such... It has been such a big thing for me. And 
yeah personally i just could not stand it i think people will enjoy it fine yeah, if you like me watching Toy Story and Tom Hanks didn't voice Woody. It'd yeah, if someone me. else did, and they did a fine job, yeah. but it's not Tom, ha- Tom it, Hanks. It's his brother, I like, and I don't want his brother. Would Evangelion even, like, there's this kind of weird extended universe to it, like the 1.0 films, the manga, which is totally different in tone. So yeah. I can kind of accept Netflix Evangelion as just that kind of, like, this weird adaptation of it that's part of this extended media universe where you're like, it, this is it, yeah. this kind of 2019 experiment with Evangelion, yeah. and I kind of like that weirdness to Yeah, because, like, it's Eva in general. It's not a replacement to what mm. you experienced. It's another branch of it. Yeah. It's I think that's, the 38th universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just another unsuccessful attempt. <laughs> but, um... Look, all that said, it's fucking cool to see Ava again. And I'm so glad that like a new generation are going to have easy access to it. I think that's awesome. Yeah, before it was just passing around DVDs, was it? Yep. It's, yeah, like 15 years ago you gave it to me by DVD. Yep. I, one, of my, one of my box sets, yes. <laughs> um, I'll never be able to give Fly Me to the Moon not being there. I think that song is critical for certain parts of that. I agree, and I think the music they chose is not great. I feel like they could have chose something stronger. The music they chose is so like on the nose of like melancholic opening it's, credits. It's, it's just Ray's piano theme, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah, but it, there's like there's yeah. a scene later on where someone screams, and the scream reverberates throughout the entire end credits. And when that's reverberating over "Fly Me to the Moon," it's the most just awful, uncomfortable fucking thing. But now it's just going to be over sad music, and it's just going to be like, oh yeah, this is sad, and that's going to be it. But like, but like the way Netflix works is that they don't show the credits; it pushes it up into the top left corner, mm, yeah. and cues up the next episode yep. in five seconds. Like it's not, and like the way it lets you skip the intro, like it, it's not, it's designed to be binge. Now you don't watch and the, the, the next of in Ava is super fun as well. But yeah, yeah, all that stuff is, it's not part of the structure. Strategy talk. Neve, tell us about Resident Evil 6. Um, so I'm playing a new game. It's called Resident Evil 6. This is the newest iteration in the Resident Evil series. And yeah. I gotta say, feel like the visuals, like... I really hope this is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> visuals looking good, holding up. Plays a little bit of, like... I don't know. It plays a little like a Resident Evil 5 or 4. That's weird. Do you remember when this game first came out and the camera was so cramped and there were so many complaints that a week later they patched it in so the camera was zoomed out like 50% Mm. so that you could actually shoot the zombies. That happened? Yeah. I don't remember that at all. Like you couldn't fucking shoot anything because the camera was fucking like resting on the shoulder of whoever you were playing on. Um, So I'm playing this in 2019 when what year did it come out of 2012 2012 yeah, yeah. jesus <laughs> it's spring breakers uh yeah it came out in march 2012 from or no october 2012 wow i'm really impressed you're able to remember that um yeah yeah i'm pretty i'm 99 percent sure but i could be wrong it looks it's still looking good like it there's some some surprising moments with lighting there's a bit in i've just finished leon's campaign and there's a bit in leon's campaign where you go down into like a subway track and it's like an underground tunnel and you can see the light and the shadow yes. of a horde reflected against the tunnel wall before they come around the That's corner. That's cool. And it looks so cool. But what really stands out about Resident Evil 6 is how much of a co-op game it is. I remember originally playing the solo and enjoying it, but kind of you feel Feeling like I something feel like wasn't I there. yeah, I felt felt like I should have a partner and this time I'm playing with a friend and it makes a kind of weirdly paced Resident Evil game because Leon's campaign is basically the greatest hits of Leon Kennedy. You go through every location that Leon has ever been. You have your like um, statue puzzle that reveals a secret staircase. You have a graveyard. You have your um, kind of mansion. You have the sewers. You have literally the gun shop. Like you have everywhere Leon has ever been. 
but all together and you clip through them at such a quick pace so you move location to location to location and when you're playing that as a solo player it kind of feels like there isn't a lot of room to breathe like you're just being funneled along but when you're kind of co-op the speed of that makes it really exciting because did you just see that? There's just a car exploded, the plane is going down, I'm now doing a quick time event for, to get this plane back in the air. What are you doing? I'm shooting zombies. Like, There's just this kind of reckless energy to it that just makes it an amazing action movie game. Like when you're on the plane and all the people turn to zombies and they're getting up out of their seat and your, your friend who you're playing with is trying to get it level and then you're on the floor and there's just a guy throwing tankers at you and then you're on a bullet train like it just goes through so much stuff in a space of an hour um so the energy in it is quite quite enjoyable but as just a kind of narrative it's so bad like it's such a not a great narrative not a great story yeah because it time hops over the space of a year mm -hmm. with three different storylines that all culminate at the end but you'll play as one character and then it'll cut to six months later and they wake up in a lab and you're like okay yeah like you start at, in your town and then you're in china like it's it, it goes so quickly and it's so weird like that so playing it in that sense and you do like it's three different types of games as well so chris and pierce part is like a shooter um what's Car pierce like Piers is... He's cute. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, he's cute army boy. He loves Chris so yeah. much. He yeah, I, I, even from the demo, I got that a like, lot. Like, John, he'll do anything for yeah, Chris. Like, they love each other. Fucking yeah, anything. Yeah, and, and he's just a, a, a cover base shooter. Um, What's um, Leon's partner like? Uh, Helena? It's yeah. so weird because Leon in 4 makes fun kind of dumb jokes like puns even like they're kind of dad level jokes but they work and you're kind of like i don't think capcom have any idea who leon is exactly because then you get to this because he's totally different in the movies as well yeah and this is a prequel to vendetta now awesome so it starts off with him shooting the president because the president becomes a zombie. Now, he's like, I am so in favor of that. And Johnny's yeah. like, are you okay, Mr. President? And oh, he's like, so and good. the president goes up and he's like, Arr! And just Leon go, Mr. Mr. President. Yeah. For some reason, Leon and the president were really close friends. But 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 this isn't Ashley's dad. It's mm -hmm. a different president, so it's, it's cool. So, Hel like, Hel Helena, like, or Helena, um... She's she's really like I like her, but Leon will say a dad joke and she'll kind of not play off it. She'll just kind of look at him like my sister just died, you know, because her sister does die. Yeah, you you, you, <laughs> so yeah, you uh, fight a sexy mutant sister. Zombie yeah, thing. awesome. It's one of the worst designs in Resident Evil because it's just her naked ass. Like, what's sister. the what's the girl from the? Is it the t Resident Evil? Oh fuck! It's. Chronicles, the 3DS one? Uh, Revelations? Revelations. Revelations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The sexy diver in that. I think this is worse, honestly, because she's yeah, like, like. Really? Because like, the sexy yeah. diver is like missing a leg and like just titties overflowing. She's just this, fully yeah. butt naked with her like tentacle things coming out her back and like as she lands on things, she makes weird sex noises. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a naked woman, but like they, they've got veins covering her nipples, so it's like. You've got the shape of the boob, but it's not, you know, they're not... They're, you know, no, they're, they're, she's got, like, pretty much boobs out. Like, to be honest, they're not that veiny. <laughs> like, it, there's, it's, she's just kind of naked. It's it's kind of like, you, 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 all you, right. You can, you can fill in the gaps yourself for the rest of it. And then the final boss is, like, a T-Rex. So that's pretty cool. It's the final <laughs> boss up on a roof and you need to, like, get it to eat metal rods that then you Yeah, the lightning rods. Yeah, exactly. God, that... Uh, that I don't know about that fight. So is is the last bit like Albert Wesker's like just chopped off head or whatever is like we've made a T virus so powerful that it goes directly ten million years into the past and then like a T Rex bursts up through the ground. <laughs> no, seemingly this Capcom, guy's... <laughs> I'll write you a Resident <laughs> Evil game. I'll do it. They should have dinosaurs. The virus went so back far back in this guy's DNA that it turned him into a dinosaur. Okay, that's not even that different from what I said. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm having fun with it as a co-op game, and it holds up. I'm kind of shocked at how 
much better and how much worse it seems than my original memory because i can see every complaint that anyone has of it yes uh is it still fun yes cool i should i should play that sometime guys i beat persona 5 yay Yay. and it only took me two years two years and two months two years and two months yep Yep. april 2017 Uh uh-huh that is a that is a that is a game. Yep. That's a lot of game. How do you feel about it? I don't hate it. Um It's got a decent ending, all things considered. Yeah, totally. I like the ending. I think Persona 5 is a game with some really amazing ideas that frequently executes them very poorly. Um and I think that in nearly every part of it from its game design to its story to its characters i think conceptually there's so many things about that game that are fucking awesome i think atlas drops the ball quite a bit in the execution um i think like the overall story does some really interesting stuff. I'm going to get a little spoilery. I won't get too specific, but... Um, I think it's okay to spoil a game. Yeah. That yeah. Came out. You, know, you know how people get about, like, RPGs. Anyway. It came on Japan three years ago. People got upset about, like, Final Fantasy VII spoilers. Well, then, maybe... They... Fuck them. You're right. No, yeah. Brian, fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> fuck them. Um, like, I do think it's really cool that, like, you go where you're, like, teenagers oppressed by, like, these adults in society... And the game actually carries that to this really interesting place conceptually where you're like constantly fighting against this authority and then the final authority you're fighting, this like final boss, is like society's belief that there is a god. Not god, but society's belief that one exists. And I thought that was actually like really interesting. Like it it was conceptually a lot better than I think I thought that game had in it you know Um, the problem to me is like how that story is told because Persona 5 to me just constantly felt like a story being told to me through a group of characters I did not feel like I was experiencing it myself at all I felt like Something would happen, and then everyone would gather in a room and talk about it non-stop. And it was like... And even when exciting stuff happens in that story, as long as it takes to happen... Like, there is stuff towards the end of the game that I thought was interesting. God, like, just the way they explain it, it's like it's like you're an idiot, you know? And you don't experience it yourself at all. Like, um, a major plot point of the story is basically skipped over and then explained back to you. You know the bit, Brian, where yep. you get... When you catch up with the flashback, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. Um, and then, like, there's other, I guess, payoffs that they put, invest so much time in, like Morgana. Like, what is Morgana? Yeah, and also uh, that guy's deep voice and why he's, he doesn't have the same voice. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cute because they didn't yeah. get too specific with that. But with Morgana, it's like... Is Morgana a human? Why doesn't it have a memory? What's going on? And then you find out and it's like... It's not, it's not like a reveal even. It's just, oh, this is what Morgana is. Okay. And it's like, alright. Sure. And it doesn't really change anything about the character. And then like, frequently in the social links... Just, the characters don't really feel like they progress at all, you know? And it's interesting because there's several points in the dialogue in the story where the characters talk about how much the main character, Johnny Midnight in my case, had, like, saved them or, like, changed them. Like, he had made them people that they weren't before. And I really didn't get that feeling from them a lot. I thought they were pretty constant, except maybe for Taba and Haru. Don't worry. Yeah, okay. I thought it was the Persona Police. Fuck. Um, there are really good social links. I think for the most part, Fataba's social links were pretty good. Um, Haru, I didn't get to finish Haru's, but I did start, and her one's actually really, really good. Haru's is very difficult to finish on a first run. You literally have to have, like, nothing else going on. I and have a bunch of stuff available. I, I got the, my proficiency up that I could. Like, I got it to, like, rank 6. If I had more, a couple more days, I could have maxed her out. Yeah. But I 
it was kind of an accident. So how many girlfriends did you have at the I end? I don't think that's appropriate, honestly. I think that's a really personal question. I don't really feel like getting into that on the podcast. Just say a number. It would probably be easier to list the girls that I wasn't with. Go on then. <laughs> the reporter. Okay. The fortune teller. Okay. Haru. That is all. And you didn't have like a main true love? I did, Anne. Oh, okay. You had the shogi girl? Yep. Wow, nice. Yep. Um, so you beat the game pretty much on the 25th of December. Yep. But then there's three months of just you pressing X as you go through, like, I guess a visual novel. Yeah, but, it, that, that bit didn't take that long for no. me. But then, like, you hit the February 14th, and that's Valentine's Day. And your girlfriend comes to, over to meet with you. Mm -hmm. But you send that text out to every girlfriend. Yep. What happens? Uh, they kick the shit out of you, I think. That's what happened? Yeah. And who's your friend, uh, the the blonde guy that has the, the, the limp and the bad posture? Ryuji? Ryuji. I like how Ryuji texts you and goes, Hey man, I uh, hope you're having a good Valentine's Day. Uh, I, I got chocolates from my mom. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I didn't do much with his storyline at all, so I didn't get him there. Um... There's stuff that gets a lot better at the end of that game. Like, the combat really opens up in, like, proper interesting ways. Like, you start getting moves where you can, like, charge your attacks and, like, you know, build... There's, like, a re charge move where it's, like, you do more than double damage the next turn. And I think that's kind of interesting because it's, like, a kind of risk-reward thing because a lot of enemies will, like, stop you from attacking and stuff like that. And that actually got... I actually did was pretty invested in the combat and I had some strategies and stuff by the end. But Jesus Christ, you've spent like 80 hours in that game with the most bare ass combat in the world. It's like hit an enemy with their vulnerability, then attack them. Yeah. And you just combo in your yeah, favor. And like it's annoying because that 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 system does have depth. It just doesn't come out until like you get so far in. But um Yeah, like overall, like I liked it. I, I, I was not as down with it. I was not as down on it as I really thought I was going to be. I thought the ending was strong. I, yeah. I thought it was cool. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of the other thoughts I have on it, we've kind of already talked about. But, like, yeah, it's it's a decent game. But, god damn, I feel like it could have been great. And I really wish Atlas had spent their resources differently. I think the fact that that game's 100 hours long really fucking hurts that game. I think that it should be half that, double the quality, and then you'd have a great game. Are you, are you going to get the Royal Edition? Hell no, I'm not. Are, are you going to get the, the Rhythm game that came out last year? You know what, if I saw it, if... I want to I wanna dance as I'm. Okay. Are you going to get the 3DS game that came out last month? God, absolutely not. Because... 3DS games are still coming out, yep. and one of them is a fucking Persona, sure Persona Etrian Odyssey spin-off with the, with the Persona Five gang. When the end credits are rolling, and you have like the last cutscene where they're like driving you. Oh, the bit, the bit where that's you, cute. The do you think they're dead yeah. then? What? When they're driving away, do you think they're dead? No, no. I, th I think okay. that's uh, that's one of those. They it can't drive their children in a cat. What happens <laughs> is the main guy, who's who's actually called Akira, is like is 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 his unofficial name. He like goes out to the roof and he sticks his body out. I like to imagine because there's a bunch of seagulls in front of him, a seagull just decks him in the head. <laughs> but like, it's, I, it, I it, saw a woman attacked by a seagull today. Yeah, they're fucked up. I just heard a scream and there was just this big fucking seagull flying away and a woman being like, oh, oh. "They're the worst animals. They're yeah. so slippery as well." Oh, I'd never want to touch a seagull. Jesus. But um, yeah, that's Persona Five. I'm really happy it's out of my life. I, I'm looking forward to going back to Dragon Quest XI. Brian. Yeah. Let's talk about Cadence of Hyrule. Yeah. Uh, have you played much of it? Uh, about two hours, maybe. I've beaten it. Yeah, it's only like four hours, isn't it? Um, I've checked the score records, and you could beat it in 15 minutes. Jesus. I think it took me like 12 hours. I was so bad at it really? at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, because the rhythm stuff? Yeah, and like... The way it's designed is that, like, there's four dungeons, you could do them in any order, but the overworld of Hyrule is predetermined, but then the dungeons are roguelikes. Yeah. But it's only, like, one or two floors. Yeah. Um, but when you walk around the, the overworld at the start, and you're getting the hang of the rhythm and the controls, and you only have three heart pieces, and, like, fuck all items unlocked, 
it's quite difficult. But when you do one or two dungeons, all of a sudden you have a lot more. And the way the game works is that if you die, you lose all your bow. Uh, so you, you, you will lose all your arrows, but you keep the bow. So, like, you're fine. Yeah. Um, And you lose, like, what's in the jars, but you could just refill the jars with potions. But But the game gets super easy towards the end. But I did find at the beginning I was just, like... Exploring at my own pace. I liked that. Yeah, I, no. I, th- I thought that felt <clears throat> good. For the first time in ages, it felt like I was playing what it used to feel like playing a Zelda game as a kid. Totally, actually, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and it, I think it's it's beautiful. I think the art style is really cool. It's like, amazing. The sprites. Yeah, uh, the music's really good too. My only problem with the music is there's this like vocals in the music, and there, there, there's there's a couple people at work I've been asking about with this because they're playing it too, and I'm like. You you uh you, you'll uh, go go into a dungeon and there's a merchant. Yeah. But the vocals are. Yeah, that he's from Crypt of the Necrodancer. I don't like that noise. <laughs> oh man, people love that guy. Yeah, because like I've I've heard I've like do you like that noise and people are like I don't. And like I think I think if you don't like a noise in a rhythm game, that's the kind of a problem. Uh, I don't mind it, but I, I played Necrodancer, so... I, 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 I remember watching the trailer for Necrodancer, and that was throughout the whole game, and I was like, Oh, that's not a nice noise for me. That's, that's just not... <laughs> that's not a nice noise for me. It's we just, got another t-shirt. It's just... I don't... I didn't... It didn't... It hurt my ears. Fair enough, yeah. I mean... Other than that, though, I think the music is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And they've got songs from all the Zelda games. Yeah. Oh, that Gerudo Valley song is pretty yeah. good. Um, I know. I, I'm really, I love this game. I was really impressed with it. I just bought it on a whim. I, mm-hmm. I wasn't planning to buy it. I was like, oh, neat. That, that, that's cool. The Crypt of the Necro Dancer fans have a game for them again. That's um, that, I, I'm, I'm fine. And then I ended up playing it, and I was like, wow. Do you think you'd play <laughs> Crypt of the Necro Dancer? Absolutely not. Fair enough. I, I don't I, 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 I like I place the cutscene with the main girl Cadence yeah fuck her uh, I just I, I, <laughs> Cadence is cool I'm, I'm like sure I, I'm sure she's there for Zelda yeah she's cool as Shovel Knight alright I, I started playing as Link and Zelda right away I, oh and I, I, I also unlocked another character which I was kind of neat oh cool I've done a lot of exploring in that game because I, like I do not like the villain nice she shit yeah then uh, they, like and the bosses of the dungeons are a piece of piss I actually find the dungeons bit challenging but then the actual bosses of the dungeons are just like Ugh. i think the first one was some weird oboe mage or something they actually gave me some trouble yeah but this is the first dungeon so yeah probably... no the game gets so much easier as it goes yeah. on but like yeah no like it does feel like you're exploring a world and you're like maybe if i try this or maybe or how about i check this out and yeah. it's cool yeah I, it's I, cool i i like it I, I really liked it but um guys i played bloodstained Ritual of the Night? Yeah, Ritual yeah, of the Night I is the full game. I always get between that and Curse of the Moon. Curse of the Moon is yeah. the retro prequel. Um, so this is the... Uh, Koji Igarat. Ko- Koji The Iga. The Iga. The Iga Kickstarter game. And um, it's interesting. This definitely feels like a Kickstarter game. In that you can tell that there's a budget here and they have to stick to it and it becomes kind of apparent in like a couple of sections like parts of the game feel quite rough and unfinished the opening cutscene is like it's just a storyboard pretty much and like it's a storyboard on like parchment oh I you know see. that kind of yeah way. okay they're, yeah. they're using what they have yeah hide, hide those mistakes but one thing I'd have to say is I feel like they're using what they have very effectively mm. because then the game starts and the characters start talking and the voice acting's like really good like it's really hammy but it's it's good hammy you know like these mm-hmm. are really good actors and it's cool because um, one thing I really wasn't expecting out of the game is the main girl in it Miriam maybe um, she's awesome She's really cool. She's really likable, and she's like a she's like a goth Lara Croft. Cool. And love it. <laughs> yeah, and um, I wouldn't say the game looks amazing, but there's fun ideas. Mm. I went into one room, and there was just a giant house cat <laughs> setting things on fire with its mind. Amazing. Yeah, there's stuff, you know, and I've been having a really good time with this game. Now. You know, you've seen, you've, everyone's seen the Kickstarter. It's like, Igarashi wants to make Symphony of the Night again. 
that's what this game is. It will not exceed your expectations. It is Symphony of the Night again, but it's cool. And like he's added in stuff from later Castlevania games like absorbing enemy attacks, which is like really actually fun and satisfying because the way it works is that you kill an enemy and you have a random chance of them dropping a shard. And you, the first time you drop a shard from an enemy, you get this big fancy cutscene where it like flies into Miriam's chest and all this kind of stuff. And it's kind of cool. And then you like have their move to use. But what's cool is that if you kill, if you can find, if you keep killing those enemies, you'll get more shards and you can level up that spell like by five times. And for, for a lot of spells, like it's not just that you get a damage bonus, but the spells work differently. Like it'll be a bigger area of effect or, you know, actual mechanical changes as opposed to just like a damage buff, which is mm-hmm. kind of awesome. And um, parts of the game, a little rough, you know, parts of it do not look great. But I think if you're okay with that, this just feels like a really just satisfying, like, Castlevania game. And it's totally not like Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, where, you know, Curse of the Moon, so much thought has gone into each enemy placement. And if you get hit, it's like, fuck, I, I, you know, I, I lost a pip of health here and I'm going to need that against them. It's really not like that. This is like a like basically you know open world open castle castlevania game where you can kind of go any which way you can take a lot of damage from enemies it's like it's not the same kind of game but it's good and igarashi made a good game and i'm really happy i hope it does well um because it's it's i'm really happy that he got to do his thing again did you back this on kickstarter no no and you're playing the ps4 version ps4 version because i know the switch version just came out but it has problems with yeah, it yeah i hear that it's 40 euro as well which i think is i thought that was a little and i would say if people are reluctant um i, I wait for the sale which it will I, I, definitely get yeah, a sale I, I think this is going to be on sale in three months so i'll probably get it then but yeah I, I, I am really curious to play it because you've played symphony of the night yeah but um i really like the area games with soma cruz that he also directed They're it's my it's it's one of those like yeah. i don't think like as long as you have your like just keep in mind it's a kickstarter game it's not it's it's like when i play something like show not show night um, hollow knight and it's like it's kind of like a metroid game but it's like just this I, I feel like Hollow Knight is totally its own thing as well, where it's just this kind of really fresh feeling experience. Bloodstained isn't that. But it's still cool. It's a video game ass video game and I'm having a good time. Neve, are you having a good time with Plague A Tale of Innocence? A Plague Tale, Innocence. I can never get that right. Yeah. <clears throat> it's kind of a mouthful. I've never seen gameplay of this. I've only seen like pre rendered footage. Is this a game? Um, yeah, so it is a kind of environmental puzzle, third person action adventure narrative driven game. The Rats of Us. The Rats of Us. <laughs> Has anyone. Did I? Yeah, I think you made the first joke ever made. Episode 102 <laughs> The Rats of Us. The Rats of Us. Um, this is a pet project by a studio let me see where they're from is it the netherlands is this like a small team but it looks like a triple a game but exactly. it has 100 like, percent. but like it, exactly but it. like it's a double a budget kind of thing this is oh a sobo uh studio which is a uh, french oh bonjour uh studio um yeah it's exactly that it feels like a little bit what was it Oh, the... Yeah, oh, for fuck's sake. Something Blade. Hellblade. Hellblade. There yeah. we go. It feels kind of like that, oh, where it's yeah, just like, yeah. we can make a triple A looking game. And this game looks gorgeous. It is very... Um, medieval looking countrysides and forests rendered really beautifully with lovely sunset lighting and just... just it, everything looks like um, a concept, a piece of concept art, and it looks so good. Um, it was a pet project where they wanted to make a game about the plague, which interests me just as a concept. Like, w- who loves the concept of the plague so much? Yeah, it's, you know, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of so that like I thought that was interesting. And they were kind of like a lot of talk was kind of about the kind of historical aspects and you when you're starting to play this game you kind of realize it's not historical at all like it's so fantastical it's a fan it's a high fantasy story totally 
Like, there's um, not wizards, but there might as well be. Yeah, featuring the plague, 100%. So you kind of, like, you kind of think you're going to go for this really hard bru- brutality of it. And that is there, um, but there is a very soft, fantasy, earnest edge to it. So you play as a girl called uh, Amicia and her little brother Hugo. And Amicia is, she's a teenager. She's she's a child, like, she's she's young. And she has been raised pretty much separately from her child like very kid brother hugo who's around seven years old maybe younger i don't know what age children are they're all small <laughs> he's around seven ish just a small little person and they've been kept separate because he's been ill and her, their pe- mother has been taking care of him all this time so amicia doesn't get to see her mother that much either and she spends a lot of time with her father while out hunting with her dad uh, their dog goes missing and yes, the dog dies in this game and that is the kind of point of no return because it something liquefies the dog in a very Freddy Krueger-esque way. Like sometimes the brutality and gore in this is really unexpected for how lighthearted the narrative seems sometimes. Not the narrative, but the characters and setting. Um... Is it like King Arthur kind of fantasy? Yeah, kind of. Okay. There's there's a little bit of that. They're kind of like they're lords of a land and they have kind of like um like serfs around them. Yeah. They go back home and some of the townspeople and I think the king's guard are there and they're looking for Hugo and looking for the family because an illness has spread into the child he, uh, into the into the land and Hugo has been kept separate and he's kind of the townspeople know of this because he was a sickly child so, so they think he's patient zero yeah they they think he's the cause of the plague so their family are killed and Amicia and Hugo who she's never lived with before she doesn't really know but loves him because he is her kid brother she needs to take him by the hand and get him to safety and that's that's what the game is from that point out so the gameplay is literally amicia you're as amicia and you get to hold hugo's hand it does a thing that i really hate when you're holding hands the perspective of the camera shifts between the two characters so no one's in the middle you know what I mean? It's like yeah, it's, that, that. it's hands. Their hands are where the camera's kind of so in the middle that, of the screen. Oh, so like it, it it works that as the anchor point for everything. Yeah, so okay. it kind of feels like you're reversing a car around corners sometimes <laughs> to get this kid around things. Oh, yeah, like a weird articulated truck with yeah. a pivot in the middle. You don't feel like you're playing Amicia sometimes, like with Hugo being dragged along. You feel like you play you're playing as two people anchored together in the middle. <laughs> And it's kind of that that to me kind of pulls me out of it a little because it feels really weird to move them. It's primarily a stealth game. Amicia will like Lara Croft and Tomb Raider. If she gets caught by a guard, it shows a pretty brutal cutscene of her being stabbed through the chest with a sword or a spear or whatever that's there. And she will die in one hit. So the gameplay essentially becomes you solving an environmental puzzle for you to get past the guards using stealth. So you can throw a rock. Amicia has her sling. And that will like bounce off a piece of metal and draw their attention and their cone will shift and you can pass through. There is only one way to get through each of these sections. You aren't provided with a place and you can stealth your way through in whatever way you want. You're basically discovering the path the game wants to take you. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of shoveling you through. The designers know what they want you to do. Exactly. You are not doing anything outside it. And that works in a lot of ways because sometimes it's very cinematic like every adult in this is bad so the, amicia and hugo these children went from having this loving home to adults killing adults in front of them and then every kind of person they think could be safe is an adult trying to kill them so there's moments where you're running through the town and this kind of guidedness through the world makes it feel really cinematic and you're moving really fast and it's really cool there's other times where it's just you feel like you're on a just tracks like you're like why can't i go this way it's because the game doesn't want you to go that way yeah this wall looks low enough for them to get over you're trying to take the box that will progress the game exactly yeah. it's like you're always that's, moving that's never towards a safety. good feeling yeah. yeah uh where the play comes into it is the most fun mechanic and the most interesting mechanic which is the rats 
and the rats are just this entire moving floor of little rats just like running over each other and just cycling over each other in such like masses and as you move whatever forward, technology is happening with those rats it's cool it's super cool is, is, is it like the swarm in the halo games but just like more collision more there's more of it and you world have... war z yeah, okay, more wow. like that, but small. They're, just, they're really scrambling on each other. Yeah, now. they are climbing And, like, each other. they will engulf you. Yeah, like the piranhas in Tomb Raider. If rats get in the Cien Hugo, they travel up them and eat them. Yeah. Like piranhas, instantly. Jesus. So you're moving through the world, and they don't like fire. So then fire becomes your puzzle mechanic. So you're moving from fire location to fire location. You see a burner up in the ceiling. You use your sling to get it to come down, and that's how you progress. Um... I'm having fun with it. The gameplay is repetitive. Like if what I sound I'm describing is boring, like that is the game. That's how you move through your world. And kind of what's keeping you invested and what's keeping me invested is the story and the characters. Um, there, I will say some of the boss fights, you're using your um, Amicia sling, which is kind of slow and they're more in confined spaces. There is something scary of a grown man in armor swinging a club at this child and you trying to dodge it. Like, that can get tense. I, I think that's cool. I really... I love when when stuff's like, okay, you're playing a video game. Character isn't very strong. Here is an able-bodied man. They are the boss. Yeah. I think that's cool, you know? And, like, it works. There was, like, the first fight with, like, this big, huge guy. I felt vulnerable. I f- like, I could be killed in one shot. And, like... It, that that feeling overcame kind of some of the gameplay issues where it didn't feel that great. Are you constantly holding hands with the kid, or is it kind of like um, the first Ico, or yeah, Ico, where like like sometimes you need to separate? Yes. And so for boss battles, are they conveniently exactly? Like... He'll conveniently disappear, or he'll have to open a door, and just before he gets to open the door, something will happen. But like Hugo is. Hugo is one of these kids that manages to fulfill the role of being actually helpful and likable because the relationship is a child getting to know a better, a child, another child better kind of thing. Yeah. And kind of resenting it because Hugo's a kid and he doesn't realize they're in danger. So they're hiding from guards and he'll start shouting and they're like, shut the fuck up, Hugo. And Hugo's like, no. And he's just kicking his legs against things. And like they, the voice acting is good and it captures it in a really great way. I am on chapter 8 of 17. Wow. <laughs> yeah, That's so a big game. It's bigger than you would expect. How much is it? Is this like a full price game or what's mm, it? It's, it's kind of like it's 40. Same price as Bloodstained. Yeah. So Such a weird price point. It is. I wonder exactly. if you're going to start seeing more stuff at it. Because yeah. that was sending you a sacrifice as well, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I loved I love these type of games. I don't I don't know. Sometimes their their goal to look so triple A. I think, I mean, I could let go the graphical fidelity for some other stuff. Yep. Personally, uh, one thing I'd say is that I've seen like the final section of the game. Seems like that would really be worth seeing. Yeah. Seems like there's some cool stuff going on there. Yeah, I'm happy to keep going with yeah. it, and I'm glad it's. I'm glad these kind of not fully AAA titles are out there. Yeah, I hope they become more common. Yeah. 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 Brian. Yeah. I have been so curious about how you are getting on with Odin Sphere Luftreiser. Luftreiser. God damn it. Luftreiser. It's Norse. It means uh, life or like the collective human life. It's... Have you ever played Odin Sphere before? Uh, no, I've played more Massa. And I've played Dragon's, Dragon's Crown, Crown uh, but Odin Sphere is before the, those two games. Yeah, and it was originally a PS2 game. Yeah, uh, this this is a I guess a re-release, but way more optimized because the original game used to take forty hours to play. Yeah, this has reworked combat as well. I think. Yeah, because uh, there is a lot of potion making, but I could see how they like streamlined. Yeah, and... I couldn't tell you what the quality of life differences are. I but I can remember that early one being awkward as fuck. I'm playing this on the PlayStation Vita because turns out the Vita has a, a lot of like uh a, 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 like in in the last year a bunch of PS4 games came out or in the last two or three years I guess uh came out on the PS4 but they also had Vita ports that I didn't know about. Really? And Sony had a sale the, the previous month and they were all Japanese games on sale. So I picked this up for like 6 euro. 
It's a good price. And I just got it because I was like, well, look. It I looks like, great. Yeah, it looks it looks amazing. It plays really good. Um, I'm still on the first character. I think there's like four or five characters in this game. Yeah, I think so. But it's cool because you, you, uh, you, you uh, can go into the menu and you can see where you are in the timeline, like the overall timeline. Because I got to a new chapter, but a big chunk of story happened in the background. And I meet characters that I think I play as later on from their perspective. Um, but yeah, no, so far it's really, really good. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I always liked that game in theory. I could never quite sink my teeth into the, at least the PS2 version, yeah. which was very different to this version. Like, there were so many cool things about it, but it was... You know the way Dragon's Crown is kind of awkward and weird? Yep. This was like that times 10. Yeah. Um, I I also really like Muramasa, but the thing that pissed me off about Muramasa was just like... You had these swords, but they had like uh, like a damage meter and they would break. And yeah. then you would have to use another sword. So you would have like 20 swords, but then you'd fight a boss and then you'd have five swords. Because you just have to use your ammo. Yeah. Um, but this isn't like that. Like This is more traditional hack and slash JRPG. And it's cool because like, you, 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 you've, you've got resources that you can use to like build up your HP or you can use it to build up your levels or you can use it to build up extra act, uh, extra attacks. And it has a cool skill tree like that. I, 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 it's, it's got an interesting mechanic. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing how you get on with it. Yeah, and like it looks amazing as well. Yeah, it's still. Like, it's it's cool. And, yeah, like I, I do like that the game starts off and it's a girl in a library with her cat. That's cute. And yeah. she picks up the book and sits in a chair and opens it up. All and that then, animation of her is so good. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a lovely game. Yeah. Um, Vanillaware, the studio that made it. I, I was checking up at Vanillaware. They have 26 staff. Uh, that is unthinkable. Um, they're working on. They're, they're still working on their current game, which I think is called 13 Nights or something like that. I think that. it takes place in like oh, modern day Japan with no, mechs or something. It's called 13 Sentinels. It takes place in 1980s Japan, but then there's a time skip and the mechs have already happened. It's got like a District 9 kind of vibe where it's like That's kind of fun. they've already landed. That's cool. Um a demo, a paid demo for it came out in Japan and it's out in Japan at the end of the year and it will come out in the West at some point. But they've been making it for like five or six years. I hope it's good. I really hope it's good. I like Vanillaware. Yeah. Guys, I played Judgment. And how do you judge it? Um, well, let me judge it with these judge eyes. No, no, it's called Judgment over here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, never, never mind. So, um, okay, so this is from the Axis Studio. And I'm a big fan of Yakuza and most of the things those guys do. And I've been really excited about this game. I thought the trailers looked great and I think the concept of like getting away from the Yakuza style of that game and having a similar kind of small city open world game was a really cool idea, especially from like a new character. And in some ways it really is. Um, Yagami, the main character of this, he... I think it's Yagami. He is like a detective and so rather than being this like invincible yakuza legend which kiryu was you're now a kind of i guess a more street level detective you're not like you're not this legendary badass anymore and that changes the dynamic of the story quite a lot because yagami feels like more vulnerable and he gets his ass kicked in cutscenes you know stuff like that can happen which i really like because you don't need another invincible Yakuza badass. Like nothing, nothing is going to top carry you ever in that regard. So I think it's it's really cool that they do something different with it. Where the game starts to maybe lose me a bit is I feel like this game is kind of one foot into this new kind of detective game and one foot still very much rooted in Yakuza, and it can be really frustrating. Because the game really wants you to feel like a sneaky detective. There's a lot. There's five different mechanics for opening a door. Like a, a hard push, a light, a light one. No, a lock like pick. as in different gameplay modes. So there's like I think there's. Can you slide a credit card? That I, there's something really similar to that. There's like yeah. uh, There's a, either two or three different lockpick mechanics. There's like punching in codes for a, for like you know on a key card. When you come to a door. Yagami keeps all the keys he ever finds on a keychain and you have to go through all the keys to find the unlock. <laughs> and I think that's cool. Here's a problem. One of the one of the like levels I did, you go in, 
you have to like lock pick the door so you spend a little time and you're like and like the lock picking mini game is good it's well done it's very sensitive and like you do feel like you unlocked it and so i unlock a door then i go in and there's another door so i have to do the same thing again and i unlock that door then once i get through that door i walk in and there's a bunch of yakuza guys and i beat them up and all of a sudden it's I feel like that feeling of being a detective, the kind of sneaking part of it, is kind of shattered because it just reverts back to this, like, really kind of yak as a feeling stuff. Mm. And to be honest, I don't think it feels very good. Um, So there was just a bunch of thugs waiting around in a locked room. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) You spent, like, you opened two doors to beat up a bunch of thugs. Yeah. Like, like the main guy was like, no, you guys wait in here. And, like, he's going to break in and I want you you to beat him up. You both, like, dipped your toe in yak as a at least. Yeah. Does this sound familiar? The first boss of this game is you fight the head of a small Yakuza family in his office. Yeah. It's literally like 70% of Yakuza bosses. And are, is this like reused location, reused animation from the Yakuza series? There's a lot of reused stuff. I, I was like watching a Rebecca. A lot, a lot of I was watching reused. Rebecca play it and she was like, this is this is Kiryu's like shrug, or this is like it's the same skeleton. Yeah. Do you um, think the character suffers from that? Does he feel less of his own person because oh, of these? Him, not so much. Mm. Everyone around him, yeah, totally. Um, and it's a sh- it, it, it's it's a shame, you know, because like there is really cool stuff about the game. Like, um, Yagami's cool. He's he's interesting, but I guess a problem I'm really having with it is I think one of the most amazing things that Yakuza does is I feel like every part of that game is built around the character of Kiryu. Kiryu is an invincible badass. You are an invincible badass in the fights. You hit a single button and he does a bunch of crazy shit and just takes out like eight people. And it's like empowering and it's like a weird fantasy. And you're like, Kiryu doesn't pick locks on doors because he's fucking Kiryu Kazuma. He'll just kick it in. It doesn't matter. Everything about the Yakuza games is, like, bringing you into Kiryu. Even the really dumb, like, karaoke stuff. I don't feel the same way with uh, with Yagami. Because, like, Yagami will get his ass kicked in a cutscene by a bunch of, by, like, five guys. Then the same five guys will drag him outside. Then gameplay happens. And then you kick their ass. And it's, like... I just wish they would commit. Like, you know what you're saying, Neve, about um, Plague Tale? Mm. Plague, a tale of innocence? A plague Tale. Innocence. Jesus. And, like, about how, like, just the one guy felt so threatening. You don't need to go that far, but at the same time, I think if, like, if Yagami's, like, just this detective, how cool would it be if they reworked the combat a little bit so it's, like, now one guy is a much bigger deal because you're not Kiryu anymore? Mm. And maybe that's not the game they want to make, but I think they either need to make another Yakuza game or really embrace what this new detective style game should have been because it's not really there for me. What happens if this was called Yakuza Judgment? Would that like if they put it in the Yakuza world and it played like this and it it just seemed, yeah, with all this extra stuff, would that make more sense for it is it weird that it's its own thing but is so related to yakuza in every way well for me like the problem isn't conceptual the problem Mm. is mechanical like it is the gameplay systems and how the game wants me to embody yagami in one way and then not in another the fact that it's like has yakuza in the title wouldn't really i guess affect me like that you know what i mean Mm. um and there's also the problem of like you know, I'm kind of playing it, but also, like, I've been chipping away at, like, Yakuza Kiwami 2, and a lot of the times when I'm playing this, I really just feel like I was. I wish I was playing Kiwami 2, you know what I mean? I don't think the combat's very good in this. It feels like a step backwards. It's like you have two combat styles, um, one for, like, dealing with people one-on-one and one for dealing with crowds of enemies. Honestly, they're not different enough to really stand out from each other. I don't think they both have all these really giant flippy kicks and stuff like that and yeah it's like it just i think that's kind of a missed opportunity too is the mystery good yeah it's it's got a good story right um, they always do yeah like it, it like i'm i'm curious if not invested um like it's a lot of the same shit you know it's like 
Looks like this Yakuza boss is hiding something, except whereas Kiryu always unintentionally blunders his way into solving a mystery, in this you're actually directly going after it. And some of that stuff's really cool, but um, yeah, I just, I'm not super taken with any of the characters yet, and part, I think that's maybe a little unfair because like I'm, I'm, I'm always comparing them in my head to either Kiryu or Majima, who are two of my favorite video game characters ever, so it's not... It's not like I can just expect like Yagami to be as good straight away. There's something about him that like Kiryu feels like classic. There's something classic about his design where Yagami kind of feels like a guy in the sense he feel he looks like an ASOS or a H&M model. I think Yagami will look silly in four years. Yeah. Whereas Kiryu never will. Or always did, whichever. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's like, I feel like if his jacket was a little more beaten up or had a little bit more personality, yeah. everything just feels like off the rack. Which now, what, kinda... I, what I would say is like, he has a really tired look to his eyes that I think mm. really like goes into his character well because he's like a disgraced detective, you know, he, or a disgraced lawyer. He yeah. got this guy off on a murder charge and the next day the guy murdered his girlfriend and that was like you know and the stuff you find out about like the Japanese criminal system is all really good and maybe maybe they're just setting up for a lot more of that because I'm about 10 hours into this game but I guess what worries me a little bit is like I'm 10 hours into this game and I'm not into it yet I'm still Mm -hmm. kind of making a very conscious decision to go play it in the evenings as opposed to just getting pulled back into it and I think that's a shame because I think this is this would have been a great new start for the series and like a good opportunity to people for people to find out why these games are good. But right now, as is, I could never recommend this game over Yakuza Zero as an entry point for the series. It's just it's just not that. And I'll report back and I really want to like it. Like I was this was one of those cases where I was like going into the game being like, this is like you know, potentially one of my games of the year. Like, this is going to be, this is a big one for me this year. And I feel pretty lukewarm about it, and that's super disappointing. There's other little very pedantic stuff as well. In Yakuza, the cutscenes always play at 60 frames a second. Gives them this really smooth look that I really, really adore for those cutscenes specifically. The cutscenes in this play at 30 frames a second, and... It just means that the game plays at 30 frames a second and the cutscenes are at 30 frames in a second. And I guess what I liked about the Yakuza ones is the big fancy cutscenes that framed it, played at 60, it was like you knew there was shit going down. Like the game was signaling to you, okay, playtime's over. And I hope it's good. Oh, some of the good stuff, like when there's a lot of missions where you're just a detective and it's not like you're not following Yakuza, you're not trying to solve a big mystery, you're literally just seeing like if this woman is cheating on her or trying to get this guy's jo- like jacket back or figuring out this guy who's like stealing underwear with a drone and just stupid stuff. And I like that stuff. I like that a lot, but it's the point at this of this game where it's still a Yakuza game that it's losing me. Because if I want a Yakuza game, I feel like I can play better Yakuza games than this. And I want it just to be its own thing. Hopefully it gets more different as it goes on, but I guess we'll see. Haven't played Samurai Showdown yet, but I want to play that at some point. The DLC is currently free. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta get on that. You gotta. I gotta. Guys, I think that's all the games we played. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, th- I think we played a lot of games we for a video a game. Lot of games for a video game podcast. We made the effort and played some video games. Finally, I think that yeah, yeah, good for us. Good for us. Quick time events. Yeah, and this is where I guess things get a bit lackluster. Uh, it's <laughs> thanks. <laughs> It's time for that post E3 slop. Here we go. There is not a whole lot in the news. Nah. Um. I was just going to talk about Nintendo Treehouse. That was it, really. Go for it. Is that cool? Um, yeah, like, I guess after Nintendo's Direct, they stick around for E3 and they live stream uh, demos and they kind of flesh out a bit more of their topics, I guess. So... They showed off some games that weren't part of the Direct. Uh, one of them really caught my eye was Hollow Knight Silk Song, which is out later this year, but I was not expecting people from Team Cherry or people like like bringing a build of the game over 
uh, and just talking talking through it. And it's a half hour video, and it was it's really really fucking good. What's um what's the new stuff in that game? Well, you're playing as um, Hornish, um, and I think it's a prequel, but they they were kind of ambiguous about it. But she just plays completely different to uh, the, the 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 knight. Yeah, some of the stuff with like her th- her her needle and thread. Yeah, that looks so good. <clears throat> She's a cool design. Really cool. Yeah, and she can grab onto ledges, um, and because it's a Metroidvania, grabbing onto ledges is a big deal, because that just means that you're unlocking, uh, it, like just 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 about exploring the map. That it completely changes it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like, they showed enough and they were demonstrating things without giving too much away, and I thought it was it was just really cool because like I just was not expecting that to be there, uh, considering they're so kind of very very top secret about their stuff while it's in development. From following them the last year or so, uh, they showed off ukulele the, the 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 demo of that where they're looking at. The Donkey Kong Country Returns, that and Tropical Freeze. How do you feel about that, Brian? What's the name of the studio? Platonic. Yeah. I th- this this looks better than the three D platformer collectathon. Mm. Um, I think I I I think this is the right decision, um, because like this will be easier ga- game to make because they have all the models essentially. Um, I think it opens up a lot more designs, uh, like like kind of you know two D level designs, I guess. Yeah, I hope those guys find their feet. Like I hope they get a hit. Yeah, they 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 brought in David Wise again to do the music. He did the music for Donkey Kong Country Returns with Rare, but they explained a cool mechanic where you have a a hub world and the bad guy is Capital B, who's like a businessman B. Um, but they said that you can fight him right away if you want. But he's in a level that's like a tower that you scale up. But it's a very difficult level. And if you get hit once, then you get kicked out of the level. <sighs> so speedrunners could essentially, if they were good enough, they could just beat it. That's fun. But what you do is you play the main game and every time you beat a level, you get an extra pip of health. And so that means that when you try to fight the boss's level, you can take as many hits as many levels you've beaten oh interesting which, which I think is a cool mechanic yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. I've ever seen done so they no. were explaining that and I was like alright and it's got the overworld map but you can kind of like mess around with it to unlock more stuff it, it, it seemed a bit more fleshed out so I'm keeping my eye on it then they showed off Pokemon Sword and Shield there's a video of that on Nintendo's YouTube channel it has a shit ton of dislikes really? it's not it's not getting well received why? Um, I th- I thought people seemed really yeah. up on it. They showed a bit of it and like, 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 like I agree. I don't think it looks good, but I felt like people were really happy with it. Um, it like I, I I'm not getting this game. I, I'm not really interested in it. But like just what they showed of it, and I, I I know this is like a build of the game. It's not the final product. But like, I, I do I if this game is coming out in November, I don't know. I think it needs more time. Yeah. Um, they 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 were uh, like interviewing the developers afterwards, and they were like, "So we're close to a thousand Pokemon on the Pokedex now. Are they all going to be in the game?" And they were like, "No." See, I'm okay with that. That's fine. I think Pokemon fans just won't be. Some people like to carry their Pokemon from oh and whatever yeah, game that over thing to another one. Bring your yeah. Pokemon over. Yeah. Um, I just think like, I think Pokemon fans were a bit patient with it because of Pokemon Let's Go. Pikachu and Eevee was such a dumbed down version of the game that they were like, that's fine. It gives them more time to, you know... Yeah, I'm, do... I, think, I think people are pretty... They like those games, right? I, I think they thought it positive. was a fine stop gap. Yeah, it's yeah. a fine stop gap, yeah. but for 50 euro, that is... Hmm. You play it with one nunchuck or one Wiimote or whatever they're called, Joy-Con. Sure. Like, <laughs> there's not a lot to it. Okay. The game auto plays as well. Um, It just seemed like with this, like... This should be like the ultimate version of Pokemon that they've been like wanting for ages um, and they're not getting it yet. I think it's still like a stopgap for like what will eventually be, you know, the final, final version of Pokemon. Um, they, they showed off some of the animations and they're the exact same animations from the 3DS games. Uh, it, it just... <laughs> 
it didn't look it looked really lazy and like they know people will buy it but it just looked like they're just doing the bare minimum i i i, I don't know i i, I feel bad like you, you know you, you know how everyone likes pokemon but then there's like i i, I you know, like for a game that has like big deal tournaments yeah mm-hmm. like street fighter like you couldn't do that no I, I I just don't think it's for the not for brand eight games in a row. and yeah for the money it kind of pulls in it's a bit lackluster yeah I kind of get the feeling Game Freak like really struck it lucky with this IP and like they're not actually that great a studio but like people like, love Pokemon they, yeah and they're really really pushing it but like it like it's a like, like it's ridiculous to have a thousand Pokemon at this point but it is a thousand Pokemon it's just like the amount of work to have a thousand Pokemon in a game is, but like, is to, nuts. Like what percent of the audience is going to get that thousand Pokemon? It's less about getting everyone and just making sure your one is there. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, it, it would suck if Bulbasaur wasn't there. Or Tepic wasn't Bulbasaur there. Bulbasaur is always going to be there. Yeah, but some people just like the trash monster and want it. Well, of yeah. course they do, because it's amazing. Yeah. I, I don't know, like, you, you know how the catchphrase has got to catch them all, but, like, you, you literally... I, you know what? Yeah, okay. Like, you can't catch them all in this game. But, yeah. So, wait, the Pokedex is a thousand. I, I, I think... Well, like, because usually with a new Pokemon game, it's 100 to 150 new Pokemon. Yeah. And, like, it's... I think the last iteration had about 850. So, yeah, like, it'd be the better part of a thousand at this point. Like, I'd like if they... Just got rid of them all. 150 new ones. Give them actual animation and stuff. They're not even doing that. <laughs> they should have like a flashback rewind series where they get sucked into a wormhole and they're back at Gen Tree or something. And they're like, that's it. This is what we have. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you about a game called Pokemon Conquest. Have you seen the X-Men films? Because that's what we're doing. Everyone's dead now. <laughs> <laughs> they, they want out of their contract. Mm-hmm. Is that what's happening? Is time travel happening in the X-Men movies? Time travel is like a cornerstone of X-Men <laughs> forever. You gotta wreck on yeah, the shit. That's you wreck on, wreck on, wreck on. That's happening wreck. a lot in movie franchises now, though. Like, mm-hmm. like that's, that was Terminator as well, right? It gives you a lot of leeway. <laughs> Once you get into time travel, you can literally do whatever you want. Work Man. for Star Trek. Oh, God, I'm not looking forward to when future Elfab shows up. I think they're gonna be pissed. Yeah, pretty much. I want a peg leg. I will have a peg leg. <laughs> I believe in you, Neve. I'd say you could do it. Um, yeah, like, that's kind of... Like, I don't know. I don't really have much... Like, it just seemed kind of disappointing, but, like, I don't give a shit either way, I guess. Like, I'm not getting this game. <laughs> it's just fucking Pokemon. It'll still sell super well. It's going to be the fucking game of Christmas. Hey, Brian calls it like he sees it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a game. Um, so, EA had a little congressional hearing there. And they announced that they're not loot boxes in their games, they're surprise mechanics. And I really have something to say to that. And it's that that really clears things up. I, this whole time was like, oh, these fucking loot boxes. But now that I know they're surprise mechanics, I feel like way better about it. How about you guys? As a consumer, I feel safe and assured. Yeah, I feel like EA is my friend. Yeah, like who doesn't love a surprise? Yeah, um, like surprises have been in toys for years. Are we gonna ban? Like, what's next? Are we gonna ban toys? I I don't, I really really like that dopamine rush and that I, I I like the emptiness. Yeah, me I love the emptiness. And it's just like you know the loot box opens up and for like a split second before you see all those like just you know regular blue items, it's like just all the fucking bullshit just like disappears for like a second. And for a second you just feel some fucking inner peace just for once you know surprise surprise yeah so you know what good on you ea you know it's thanks for clearing that yeah, up yeah <laughs> worse it's, it really helps a lot let's talk some emails all right i got some emails hit well, us hey, with some emails hang on if you were to email us, how 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 would you do it? Uh, you would get one of our home addresses, and you would send us a. Is that is send us John a, at 
John Jellybean Pixie Fairy at yahoo.co.uk. Is that it? At gmail.com. At gmail.com. Yeah. Knee uh, of the Orc Slayer. At hotmail. At hotmail.com. Uh, I use Proton Mail because um, that's that's one for the deep web. I still have a Yodel as well. If anyone wants to hit me up on that, uh, does Ask Jeeves have uh, an, an email? Alta Vista account as well that I think is still pretty active. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ask Let's Fight a Boss at Gmail dot com. That's Ask Let's Fight a Boss at Gmail dot com. Send us any old fucking. We like questions, right? Do you like Pokemon? Why? Email us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. This first one is from Ethan, and I'm going to read out the entire email because Uh because it's a very special email. Okay. Uh, Dear Let's Fight a Boss cast. Hey, I hope you're all well. I really love your podcast, and it has been really helping me get through the junior cert. Right on, dude. I have a question. Okay, to American listeners, junior cert means he's about like 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, being young, have done a lot of dumb things. Not as young as you once were. And I was just wondering, how do you guys, the strongest, smartest, and bravest beings in existence, deal with past mistakes you've done and how you move on? Also, do you have any past mistakes and how have you dealt with them? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry if this has been asked. I'm just not up to date, but I really wanted to know. Thank you for your help and protecting the known world from evil demons. Yours sincerely, Ethan. And then there's a P.S., we, uh, we can get we can get to that after we have to ask, ask okay, the question okay, okay. if you like. I don't think I've ever been asked this question. Have you ever, have you ever made mistakes yeah. or how do you deal with them? <laughs> yeah, Nia, have you ever made a mistake? Yes, yes, I have multiple. What was his name? <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> no that, I, I'm just teasing. John, what was his name? <laughs> For me, it was uh, it wasn't human. I mean, everyone everyone fucks up, right? Everyone makes mistakes. One hundred percent. Yes, it's part of growing up. It's just, totally yeah. It's, it's okay. You can't. I don't think you can not make mistakes. I think it's important to try and be as honest with yourself as you can and be like, you know what. I was a fucking tit and I need to apologize and I need to own it and we'll hopefully move past it eventually. For me, it's like you make a mistake and you think it's a big deal. Nobody else remembers it. You forget about it too, but then 10 years later, it pops back into your mind and you're like, shit, shit. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely it. That's where this your mistakes will stay is like a nighttime memory that yep. will come and haunt you in a really like something from five years ago, and you'll be like, "Why now? Why did I do that? Do Why you know, are you telling me about there, it?" There is a few times in my life where like I really felt like I wronged someone, and I eventually felt so guilty that I made a real effort to go and apologize to them. And this was stuff like y- years between the incident and the apology, and every single time the person has been like, "What?" <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you remember that night? And they're like, no. And I'm, I'm, I was like, I, like they're like, yeah, I remember we were at the same party, but like, I don't, no, I don't remember. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I think it's important for you to do it because I think like, if you feel like you made a mistake, if you feel like you fucked up, I know with me, my brain will never let it go until I feel like I've done everything I can to make amends and that could just be the, the latent Catholic guilt but You're, that yeah. guilt free feeling <laughs> feels so good what about you guys just endeavor not to do something dumb again it's, it's, it. it's, it's just re- like it's just like oh, won't do that again <laughs> I learn everything's a learning experience yeah you really really know your limits and you're like okay no <laughs> do we each have to give one mistake oh my god I'm trying yeah, to that's think. hard to think isn't it I'm trying yeah. to think and like and it's also like do I tell no I don't want to tell that one yeah I, I have a couple I'm kind of swishing around in my mind and I'm like mmm no, I, 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 there's some I don't feel comfortable about because they're for me and the person I wronged who doesn't remember? Yeah, the people I wronged. 
I, I can think of some of these. I don't think I've told you guys. There. There's something. Many, I was many mistakes. I was a really awful child. I I know you wouldn't think it. <laughs> <laughs> Just a really awful child. One time I was uh, at my friend's house after school. I'm not going to name names, but I'm going to tell you what I did. And obviously this is a mistake. And I know at the time it was I shouldn't have done it. And I know that now. But this is the point of this email. Uh, we I was over at my friend's house and it was me and another fr friend got invited. So there was the three of us up in his room. And next door was his sister's bedroom and his sister wasn't there. So he was like, let's go into my sister's room. And we were like, yeah, sure. And he had... His sister had a Barbie bat set that had like a little bathtub to fit a Barbie and a little toilet and uh, a bidet beside it. And I said, <laughs> wonder if that toilet works. And the guys were like, I dare you. Brian! <laughs> oh no! You little shit! I was never allowed back in the house. Yeah, rightfully so. And... I'm sure everyone else has blocked that shit out. I haven't. And no, I don't think they forget that, Brian. I, no, no, I, 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 I've been to, I've been to one of their weddings. It's okay. It's, okay, it's, it's I mean, all good now. Okay. But I'm not allowed back to their house. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Who? Cool. You. I can't think of anything that's like. Neve, you must have done some fucked up. Yeah, shit. I have, but I'm like no, Neve's definitely done some fucked up stuff. But in her head, she's like, "That's fine." <laughs> Neo. I can't think of anything, John. <sighs> what was her name? Oh man, a lot of. And what age? What age were you? Okay, this this is one of. The... This isn't really like a bad thing as much as it just was a really kind of... I think I've told this story. I may have told this story on the podcast. I've told so many fucking stories in this podcast. <laughs> but, um... Oh, God. No, no. I, I, told, my, I told my story. <laughs> this is worse than that. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. What, you pooing a toy? <laughs> uh... You don't have to if you don't want to. Look, someone, someone's listening to this and they're like, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I love the uncomfortableness. No, I don't I don't think I can tell it. Um, I, I, got, I got another one. Go on. This one's like, this one wasn't really a mistake, but I just felt super bad over it. I think I might have told this one before. There was one time I was over in my friend's house <laughs> and it was like getting late. And so I left and I stepped out into the hall and I was just like walking down the stairs, but I just turned my head at the last second. And as I did, his the door to his sister's room was open and she was standing there bollock naked. And for a moment our eyes met and I just kept I just kept walking and I felt so awful about it. And I just I still see that girl sometimes and we'll chat. And every time I'm like, I know it happened, and I know she doesn't think of it anymore because she's not an idiot, but it's always in my head and I can't apologize about it now because it's too late. Like, what am I going to do? I'm sorry I fucking saw you naked when we were like nine, you know? Yeah, you should. We can edit that out if we need to. I think all this is getting edited. This, okay. None of this is going in. Yeah. Oh my God. But I felt so guilty about that. And I still, I still get a weird like guilt pang over it. I feel comfortable saying that I've never done anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's the conclusion I've come every, to. Every decision you've made <laughs> has worked towards the, the better knee of. Yeah, Neve, it's all that. just it's just Neve, a journey. I hate you so You're fucking just, much. I I I, I actually believe it. Neve, you Neve, need Neve, to go. Neve, 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 Neve's life is just like being, no regrets. Just a, a smooth sailing. I, 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 th I think though you can have stuff. You can have you can like acknowledge you make mistakes and not have and, like it's not the same as a regret because a regret is like wishing that like it hadn't happened or you had done something different but I think it's I think it's kind of freeing just to be like yeah that happens I'm a fucking idiot I'm gonna try my best have you ever peed your pants or like puked yourself or anything like that oh one time when I was like 15 I pissed my pants <laughs> I've like pissed my pants like 
I'm every just... decade of my life I've got this shit. <laughs> just something happened. like clockwork. Just like, oh, here we go. <laughs> oh no, the curse. It's back at Disneyland all over again. Ah, oh, dear. Yeah. Have you ever made a mistake with the pukes, the barfs? You ever ralphed yourself so hard? Never inappropriately, which is a shame because I think inappropriate vomiting is fucking hilarious. Like, people get so worked up about fart jokes, don't get it. You get a just good impromptu vomit when, like, a newscaster is trying to talk. <laughs> That's the funniest shit in the world. <laughs> oh. Okay, um, and then this is the PS from Ethan. I met John at JCon and I asked him a question about if he would sign my paper box. And I'm sorry if I seemed rude. I just thought if I asked a dumb question first, it would make everyone else think, man, I can't ask a worse question than that guy. As nobody seemed to want to be the first, and th that is one of my biggest regrets, as I thought I seemed like a teenager taking the piss. Ethan, I have some great news, buddy. I have no memory of this. <laughs> Uh, I hope that doesn't sound rude. I meet a lot of people at cons in a really short amount of time. And I think sometimes my brain just filters that information in a weird way. But you definitely didn't leave a bad impression. It was like, I I have no unpleasant memories of that. So you're free, buddy. You don't need to feel bad about that. And even then, it doesn't sound like you were bad. It kind of just sounds as like you ask a silly con question, which a lot of people ask. And you shouldn't feel weird about that at all. Trust me. There are a handful of bad interactions I've had at cons, and you would not register among them. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Ethan. All Be right. free, my friend. Um, this is from Catherine. You are each trapped on your own separate d desert islands. Oh, God. The islands are minuscule, barely more than lumps of sand with some bush set in the middle of a vast ocean. As you gaze out over the horizon, you know deep down in your heart that there is no hope of rescue. You're stuck. Then there's a rustling in the foliage behind you. You turn and come face to face with the person you despise most in the world. What do you do? Murder them, obviously, right? Like, this is your only chance. Yeah. I feel like being stuck in an island with Joss Sweden and being able to tell him how wrong he is <laughs> for <laughs> as long as I want because he can't, he's not going anywhere either would actually be quite cathartic you could like be I think murdering Ben Shapiro would be cathartic <laughs> yeah I think you could like befriend them but then it's like a fake out and then you eat them that's what I'm gonna do and then, like, if rescue did ever come, you could be like, yeah, it was weird. He just started, like, strangling himself. <laughs> and eating himself, and it tasted really nice. Um, yeah, murder, for sure. Brian, yeah. what would you do? Oh, yeah, murder. Yeah, just fuck it. Like, it, it, it's fucking... It's There's nothing on the island to kill them with, though. We can drown them, oh, I, I can, guess. I can think of some very effective weapons to kill them, Nave. Yeah, John has a lot to say about anime. <laughs> a lot. Like, you should hear my full take on the Evangelion dub. We got another one? Um, actually, no, look, it's got a little PS down here. I think you're like this one. The time is fast approaching. Soon the bitter winds of winter will descend upon the world once again. And in that time, when nearly all light has faded from the world, it is my hope that the prophesized Dark Prince of the podcast will rise up with vengeance. And oh, I'm not finishing that. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, you will have a seat in my dark court. And you two fucking jesters, you will dance your idiot dance from morning till night. Alright, I got one more email. I don't know what this says. Let's do this. Let's do this. It's from TurboSonic. TurboSonic, what's up? There are three levers in front of you. Uh, each represent your favorite pieces of media. Quickly decide what those are before moving on. Okay. Do you have like three examples in your head? Uh, yeah, sure. do we say them out loud? Or? No, you just say them. Just say them. Okay. Okay. Uh, if a lever is pulled, that piece of media will be permanently erased and only you tree will remember that it ever existed. Oh, no. You must now pull one lever, either yours or someone else's, or all three... Someone else's? Or all three levers of yours will be pulled. 
I guess so. We have to know each other's. So mine would be Silent Hill 2. Okay. This is off the top of my head yeah. Final Fantasy 7 and Neon Genesis. Like, that could easily be a dozen more things, but. I guess, like, mine would be, like, One Piece and. I don't know, Wario. <laughs> Or, oh no, Kirby. Yeah, I'll just I'll just go with Kirby series, and then a third thing can be uh, a Den Wario. Um, near Kung Fu Panda. Okay, that. <laughs> and even Galleon. Wait, I, I'm changing Wario to Toy Story. Obviously, sure. Okay. So what? Near and Kung Fu Panda and what? <laughs> Tomb Raider. Uh, yeah, mate. Okay, we'll throw in Tomb Raider instead of Evangelion. Yeah. Yeah, Kung Fu Panda. No question. Yeah, that's gone. <laughs> yeah, gone. You're killing Kung Fu Panda. And I like that movie, but like compared to everything else we said. Okay, now my now for me, I've got three unreal things right there. One Piece, Kirby, and Toy Story. Like the best shit in the world. Kung Fu Panda is amazing. It's a really good movie and a great art book. It's just some really solid character design and yep. choreography. Yep. What if a panda did kung fu? <laughs> it's so good. End of meeting. <laughs> start of production. Do you know that's that's how it got started? I love it. That's that would be my pitch for something too. It's like animal does thing. <laughs> office crocodile. <laughs> yeah, office crocodile. Exactly. Hey, <laughs> love it. You want me to punch that paper? He's like that. Okay. okay, so you've killed you've you've killed Kung Fu Panda. Yep. John, John, for you it was Silent Hill, Evangelion, and Final Fantasy VII. I think we should just get rid of Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. And like at this point, it's doing more damage than good. You know what? Hard to argue. <laughs> and then me, we'll just Kirby. Be Kirby. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> like the other the other two things are good, but you you just like Kirby. Oh, I love Kirby. Yeah, I know. I think we did this the wrong way, where I think we're meant to sacrifice one of our own. Oh, no. Or take one of each okay. other's. Okay. I don't know how this works. It's a complicated game. If you were going to so take, if you got to take one of your own. Okay. The least range of emotional responses I'd get from the tree would be Kirby. Kirby only makes me happy. Makes me a bit sad sometimes, but like... One Piece makes me feel a lot of emotions, and so does Toy Story. But the other part of it is you can only talk about it with each other. Yeah, I'll talk to you guys about Kirby. So I'll keep Evangelion for that, because I feel like we can manage that. Yeah. Um, Silent Hill, too, because all for John. Yeah, and not for us. James is a cool guy, John, huh? Is he, though? How about in the next episode you call yourself James? Oh... Mm, that mm, could open up a whole can of worms. I don't know about that. What do we move on to our Patreon shoutouts? This is the best part of the podcast. Yep. Uh, Get down on your hands and knees. We got to shake that fucking tin cup. Brian, you seem like you kind of got very little going on. I do. But you got three dollars. I have exactly three dollars. What would you say if I told you that for three dollars you could get just a new fucking lease on life? Like the sun's gonna look brighter, the mountains will be taller, there'll be a spring in your step every goddamn day for three dollars a month. Sign me up. Sign you up to the Let's Fight a Boss Patreon. That's a podcast I like. There wow. you go. Oh, that's cool. Yep. Small world. Yeah, and look, you don't even got to go. You don't got to go to a building. You don't got to bring us the money each month. None of that. You just have to go to patreon.com forward slash LFAB. That's easy enough. It's real easy, right? I'd be stupid not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> a fucking idiot. <laughs> a complete goober. Okay, well, let's just... Let's just... A numbskull. <laughs> a bozo. I mean, a poindexter. Wait, is a poindexter smart or dumb? It's it's like a nerd. Well, yeah. if you want to be a poindexter, you better. So, Brian, I can tell I got you sold. Yeah. But there's one more thing. No way. I'm dead serious here. We will actually read out your message live on air. Live? Okay, I can hear the skepticism in your voice, but to prove that I'm not lying... It would sound like this. This one's from Polly. Elfab takes me down to Anime Town. 
Neve. I think I should read the last one. Okay, Brian. <sighs> These are both ne- <laughs> Queen Neve. Queen Neve word is final. That is all. <laughs> Sorry. Let me try again. The world's strongest banjo <laughs> says, "Queen Neve word is, is final. That is all. Don't trust Jam the Jester." Yeah, I don't know who that is, but I wouldn't trust him. Neve, this last one from Karenia. Karenam. 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 Hey, this is Neve from the future. I've traveled back in time to give you this impossibly important message. I don't have much time. I'll have to go back any second now, but the fate of the world depends on this. If you care about the future at all, you have to do is... I do like that that plays back to our time travel bit from earlier. Whoa. That was pretty good. Thank you, Karen Am. <clears throat> Guys, loot drop. We have defeated a boss. We've got some uh, treasures to share with you some all. Some precious treasures. Neve, what do you got? So I prepared one this week because I feel like last week was some weird energy I put out there. Just last week? <laughs> uh, I, 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 it was I, probably my weirder one, I You think. know what? Yeah, it yeah. Was. I think people loved it. I like that video. Yeah, me, I watched it all. It was good. I, I just think it's really cool to see you put on the spot and we have to see the inside of your brain and that's where it goes. That's what comes out. Um, so this one, <laughs> I've, it's not as weird. Um, it's called History of a Joke, That's Gonna Leave a Mark. And it's basically every time the phrase, that's gonna leave a mark, has been said in a film or animation or anything. And it's a lot. God, so that's such an exhausted line. I, I, yeah, I watched it. about two minutes of this and I had to tap out. I was like, I can't, I can't watch this anymore. It's nuts. It's been in so much but stuff. It, it's like that line, um... You just don't get it, do you? You know the way, like, that's never something anyone would say in mm-hmm. real life, but it's been in so many movies. I think before I saw a compilation of, like, the end of the third act and the character goes up to the rest of the characters and goes, we made it. But it was just, like, 50 minutes of we made it. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> and everyone looks so fucking proud of themselves. Yeah, it, it, it's such a fucking overused, like, joke. And it's, it's like, uh uh-huh. And its tone changes where it's kind of like... The person who gets hurt says it to someone watching someone getting hurt says it to it said it's kind of sympathetically like oh that's gonna leave a mark I to like there was a bit at the there jokingly was a bit towards the end where someone like shot someone's head off and was like that's gonna leave a mark it's, it's so weird <laughs> it it's, goes full circle <laughs> it's interesting just to see how much these kind of like it's a it's a film trope um line a bit of language that just kind of pops up and that's cool uh, I got one from a YouTube channel called Accented Cinema, and it's called Jackie Chan's Kung Fu is Fake, and no way. that's okay. Okay, phew. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because cause it's just choreographed stunts, isn't it? Yeah, and this is kind of the point of the movie, because uh, or the, the video. Kung Fu is like in a really weird spot as a martial art. Basically, with the advent of MMA, like every martial art kind of clashed together, and like The ones that were effective were shown as effective and the ones that weren't, weren't. And one of the ones that came out as least effective was Kung Fu. And, you know, if there's Kung Fu practitioners out there, like, I'm really not talking shit about it. I have a lot of respect for Kung Fu, but it's not, if you, it's it's not the most effective fighting style, especially like any fighting style where you don't spar regularly isn't going to be that effective. And what this video is about, it's about that, but that it's okay, because for a lot of Kung Fu's history, it wasn't really intended as a fighting style as much as it was a style of, like, kind of theater, pretty much. Like, in Chinese theater, there's specific segments and rules to, like, how fight scenes work and the choreography of them, and a lot of Kung Fu is based off that, as opposed to, like, a kind of practical need for combat. And it was a really interesting, just, like, examination of that, and it compared it to basically like pro wrestling like pro wrestling isn't bad because it's fake it's great because it's fake and a lot of these kung fu stuff like for those moves to look so beautiful for them to have such amazing arcs and like it's like animation you know to have like proper anticipation and follow through they have to be fake because that stuff could never work in a real fight and i don't think that's a bad thing at all i think it's awesome and it's kind of, and like the guy in the video acknowledges, he's like a big fan of Kung Fu cinema, but like he acknowledges like 
how poorly kung fu has been represented over the years because in the 80s like before the internet you had all these kung fu guys like actually like like white american dudes claiming that they could do this pretty much like instant kill kung fu and that they were these like martial arts legends and stuff like that they'd never fight anyone like that's a whole different youtube rabbit hole if you want to go down the youtube rabbit hole of fake martial arts it is (laughs) fascinating but um it's a really good look at that and like really made me respect and love kung fu even more because like even if a kung fu is not that effective it's to me it's like the most like aesthetically pleasing fighting style it's absolutely beautiful and i love it and i just thought this was like a great great video um accented cinema this guy i've watched three other videos by this guy one um about the about gamora who is basically the not godzilla um and it was fucking brilliant and it was a really interesting look at gamora and what made him special as opposed to godzilla and just a bunch of stuff i never knew about kaiju movies and eight minutes long and great and then the other one was um about an lgbt um film from thailand called iron ladies which came out in like the 80s and it was you know big on like acceptance and stuff even though like lgbt stuff in thailand is fucking rough by the sounds of it from this video and it was just great and this guy's channel is very good and i'd really really recommend him then i have mort mort on youtube who is a tutorial sprite artist i guess uh but it's just a tutorial video on how to make a game boy game using a game boy game making software and it's just a rundown of the software and just like yeah yeah, it's really easy here's some steps but like you you know when you watch a, a a video like this and you're like I got some ideas going now. I I, I do like watching uh, instructional videos where like you're Gets watching you it, creative. yeah, and and like it starts getting gears going. Where you're like, okay, so I watched this. I got a bit inspired, and if I got some free time later this year, let's see how we get on. Holy shit! It, it's really cool at the end because he 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 puts the the ROM on. A ROM cartridge and plays it on a Game Boy. Oh, that's rad. Which I, I really liked. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I just like this channel. Check it out. That's cool. What time are we at, Brian? Uh, kind of near the end of it, I guess. This is a it's a two-hour, ten-minute podcast, but we could probably edit out ten minutes because of all the awkward fumbling. Or leave it all sounds in. Like, sounds to me like we need to stretch for another for another forty minutes. What what do you guys got? Let's just let's just really lay it out. Nothing's off limits. Let's just let's come on. Let's get into it. I'm all tapped out. Neve's got something to say. Though. Here we go, Neve. I'm so tapped out. I'm. Uh, let's see. Wait, no. No. <laughs> no. I got. <laughs> you got nothing. Got nothing. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. And it has been, it's been a chill time. Time for Sleepy Town now, though. We wish you well, dear listener. Bye.